Welcome to the first session of this seminar, Modern Monetary Theory, the 16th Century Challenge by Colin Drum. Colin Drum is a PhD candidate in the history of consciousness at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He's currently writing a dissertation on the topic of monetary history and political philosophy with a focus on Mediterranean antiquity and early modern England. The aim of this seminar is to present a 16th century challenge to modern monetary theory or MMT. The central idea of MMT is that a United States Treasury bond, public debt, and a Federal Reserve note, paper money, are both the accounting liabilities of the state. And that therefore, what happens when the state pays its debt is that it is simply swapping one form of liability for another. The MMT theorists draw the conclusion that a state which, one, issues its own currency, two, taxes in its own currency, three, denominates its debt in its own currency, and four, is not tied to a pledge to back the currency with a commodity, is a monetary, monetary sovereign, which can never be forced to default on its obligations and whose ability to run a fiscal deficit, aka its fiscal policy, is constrained only by inflation and not by monetary scarcity. In other words, the state can never run out of money. Therefore, MMT is an important intervention into austerity politics which dominates almost all of our public disclosure about the limitations of government expenditure. The seminar's approach is both literary and historical. In our search for MMT sovereign, we will examine the reign James the first steward of England, the first European monarch to William Shakespeare. In studying Shakespeare's second tetralogy, beginning with Richard II, we draw also on a second or secondary historical literature, private money and public currencies the 16th century challenge by Boyer Shambio L, which suggests that the late 16th century witnessed a crisis in the European monetary system. We will read the foremost directly political plays of Shakespeare, which are deeply concerned with questions of debt, money, and witness the structural transformations in money and the state, which ushered in the modern monetary regime, in the hopes that they might have something important to teach us something about the concept of monetary sovereignty. I am now going to pass the mic to Colin Drum. Enjoy, everyone. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so just before I, I get started, uh, I, there seems to, it just has come to my attention, there seems to be a little a confusion. So uh, with the syllabus and everything, did everybody, did anybody get the syllabus or have you just been sent this one file? Okay, um, I'm deeply sorry about that. So we're gonna have to kind of uh, improvise for this session um, because Boyer Zambo is supposed to be for for next session. I'm not sure what happened um, with that, but I will um, I will make sure that for our next session uh, we get the readings uh, to you correctly. Um, so today um, I want to talk a little bit about Richard II. Um, has anybody here read Richard II? Because this is what I wanted um, you to read for today. So, oh, never mind. Um, Sorry, it was just a video problem. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to to present uh, what I have to say about Richard II uh, to you, despite the fact that you may not have read it, um, and we can talk more about it next time, um, and perhaps we can spend this session um, doing some more kind of just introductory uh, stuff about about NNT, because um, I'm gonna have to improvise a little bit, I think. But I, let me I'm gonna go ahead and give my introduction. Um, so I want to begin by quoting. Uh, this is from uh, Henry II. Uh, sorry, Richard II. Uh, Act Four, Scene One, um, and Richard II has been deposed by Henley Bolingbroke, um, and he is he is asking for for one last favor. Richard says, "I'll beg one boon and then be gone and trouble you no more. Shall I obtain it?" Henry Bolingbroke, "Name it, fair cousin." Henry, Richard, "Fair cousin, I am greater than a king, for when I was a king, my flatterers were them but subjects." Being now a subject, I have a king here to my flatterer. Being so great, I have no need to beg. Bolingbroke, yet ask, and shall I have? You shall. Then give me leave to go. Bolingbroke, whither? Richard, whither you will, so I were from your sights. Okay. Okay, so um, I originally titled this seminar uh, The Modern Monetary uh, Regime. I think that uh, maybe Mo doesn't like that word, so we changed it. Uh, but I don't mean to have any any bad connotations with the word uh, regime. The reason that I want to to speak about a modern monetary regime rather than a modern monetary system 
is because I want to emphasize that this is a system structured by kingship, by the Rex, Rex Reges, Latin. Um, and it is a system, this is kind of my claim, it's a system that is structured by kingship, even if the king does not appear at its center. Okay, it is maybe, it is perhaps it is haunted uh, by the ghost of the king that it has deposed. Okay, and so Richard II is a, is a play about the deposition um, of, of the King Richard in 1399. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the history of that as we go on and, and why it matters for us thinking about, about money today. Um, but my goal kind of over the course of the seminar is to present you an idea of a monetary system as being a political order. That's why I call it regime rather than a system. It is not a, it is not a technical system which operates according to technical rules or physical rules. It is rather a political order which behaves according to a fundamentally and irreducibly political logic, okay? Um, and so just to kind of give you a, a, a sketch of where I wanted to kind of take you by the end of our four sessions, um, I, I'm gonna try to show you in a, in a slogan that most theorists of money um, prior in, in, in a history of thinking about money uh, really stemming from Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics, which is where uh, Marx, for example, gets much of the bones of his theory of money. Um, they theorize money as being a system of equalities that is structured by equivalence. So if you've read Capital, you know in the opening pages of Capital, there's a lot of equal signs, right? Marx says 10 linen coats equal one Bible, et cetera, et cetera, right? And really where he's drawing this from is from Aristotle um, who theorizes money, who is one of the first to theorize money as being something which is fundamentally about making heterogeneous particularities um, commensurate in order to assign some kind of number to them by which they can be compared. So this is what I mean when I say that most people theorize money as a system of equalities structured by equivalence. Um, what I'm going to be presenting you is a different theory according to which money is a system of differences structured by power. Okay, and what I mean by a system of differences is that money never has one name, it never has one price, nothing in a monetary economy ever has one price. And so what we're working with is a system of spreads or differences. We're going to talk more about that as we go on, um, but I just kind of want to introduce that idea to you. So um, money, according to me, is a system of differences structured by power, and power has the structure of an option. And we're going to talk more about what an option is, and we're going to see this in, in Shakespeare. Um, so I just want to give you that schematically now, and we will explore it. Uh, but first, we need to kind of begin by talking about modern monetary theory, um, uh, which is you know very much in the news. Presumably, if you're here, you know a little something about this. Um, and modern monetary theory is really very simple. There's not that much to know about it. We are not in this seminar going to be reading a lot of the MMT literature. Uh, I don't think it's really necessary. It's not that great, it's not that sophisticated of literature and the concept is really quite simple. Um, modern monetary theory begins with an observation, which is this observation that what we use for money is a liability of the state, that's all it is. And that what happens when the state pays back its debt is it swaps one form of its liability for another form of its liability, okay? A treasury bond is a liability of the state. A dollar is a liability of the state. When the state swaps a bond for dollars, all it is doing is swapping one form of its liability for another. And this is very strange. So it raises the question, why do we have to pay back the debt? Why is it so important, okay? Um, and the concept that MMT develops out of this observation that money is really just a kind of state debt is the idea of sovereignty, monetary sovereignty, which is the idea that any entity, any state really, which borrows money in units of account that it itself creates, okay? The United States creates dollars. It spins dollars into existence. The only reason that there are dollars is because the US government is in deficit in order to spend them into the economy. Um, and because of this, because the US is borrowing something that it itself creates, it can't really ever be forced to run out of money. It can always print more money in order to, in order to pay its debts. And while this seems like a kind of shocking concept, um, maybe to some people who are unfamiliar with it, who are very used to the way that we talk in mainstream discourse about money, it might seem shocking, but in fact, it is acknowledged at the very heart 
of what's called modern financial theory. So, so uh, uh, modern financial theory depends upon um, the idea of a risk-free asset, the idea that there is some benchmark asset in the economy that is risk-free and that everything else can kind of be defined in terms of, okay? This is necessary um, for the Black-Scholes-Merton equation, um, which is how options are priced. So, so when you hear about derivatives, and options and stuff like in 2008, um, none of that would be possible without the idea in modern financial theory of a risk-free asset, which is the idea that the United States bond is riskless in part precisely because the United States can always choose to print more money in order to pay its debts. It can never be forced to default. This is what makes it risk-free. So rather than being some sort of shocking crank view that the US can't ever run out of money. In fact, it is encoded at the very heart of the, of the modern financial system, all right? And so part of what we're going to be talking about in this seminar is the history of the risk-free asset. How did it get to be that public debt of the empire of the United States could be considered to be risk-free? Um, this is unusual historically because historically, loans to sovereigns have been considered to be risk assets, okay? when. Um, when the Genoan banking syndicates are loaning money to Philip II of Spain in the 16th century, they're charging a high rate of interest because this is a very risky asset. And in fact, Philip did default on them a number of times. So there had to be a very massive structural transformation in the state and in its financial system in order to make this idea of the, the risk-free asset possible. And what I'm going to be trying to argue for you is that it's really a constitutional system, right? There has to be a constitution. It's a constitutional question about how sovereignty is configured in the state that makes all of this possible. And that's what we're going to be trying to look into the, to the history of, okay? So, um, so where MMT kind of goes from this is to diagnose our present problem as a problem of austerity, right? MMT says, Everybody that runs the world uh, right now is kind of confused about how money works. They think that money is a real asset, that the state can run out of money. And the fundamental question is, you know, how do we balance the budget of the, of the federal government? The uh, MMT theorists uh, kind of counter this with something that is called the sectoral balances identity, okay? And essentially what this says is that because money is a liability of the state. If the private sector is going to accumulate money balances as profit, the state must be in deficit. So uh, the foreign sector comes in here, in here too, and we're, a, lot of, a lot of what we're gonna be talking about in this class is the problem of the foreign sector for MMT. Um, but if we ignore the foreign sector for a moment, there must be an identity between the profits of the private sector and the, uh, li the, 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 the deficit of the state. So really when people are demanding that the state should balance its budget, part of what they're demanding is that the, uh, the conditions of possibility for private sector profitability should be uh, removed, right? They're arguing the private sector should not be able to make a profit because the, 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 the federal government is not in deficit, okay? Um, but the problem is, and this is um, where my critique of MMT begins that we're going to be exploring in this class, is that MMT diagnoses austerity as a confusion, right? MMT says people are confused about how money works. And if they knew how money works, then they would wanna do what we suggest, which is to uh, print money and spend it on infrastructure. Um, in contrast, I want to present a theory of austerity as a regime, as a, as a political order, um, and that they know perfectly well what they're doing and they're doing it for a, for a reason. Um, and doing this allows us to politicize the monetary system and to show how class struggle can occur within the monetary system itself rather than in the traditional Marxist theory merely through it, right? So for Marx, monetization is something that uh, allows class struggle to happen. Class struggle happens through the monetary system, but it doesn't happen in the monetary system itself. Um, and so I, I want to suggest to you that there is a form of class struggle. Uh, that exists inside the monetary system itself, and that this is a form of class struggle, which is actually very, very old. It's three or 4,000 years old, and, we, and it has a distinct logic from the kinds of class struggle that we're more used to thinking about. Okay, um, okay so, so why has MMT kind of suddenly leapt into prominence? Well, it's because uh, 
you know, if austerity is a confusion, if it is simply because people don't know how money works, uh, then its truth was revealed by 2008. And again, more recently uh, with the COVID crisis and the, the large Federal Reserve interventions into the financial system. Um, and, and so it was kind of revealed that the Fed uh, can't run out of money, that it can uh, print money out of nothing in order to save the assets of the financial system. And we begin to ask the question, naturally enough, if the Fed can save the bankers, then why can't the Fed save us, right? From whatever it is, whether it's from poverty or um, an issue that is more dear to my heart from climate change, right? If we can print money out of nothing in order to save the banks from uh, their own reckless uh, malfeasance, uh, then why can't we print money out of nothing in order to, to fight these vast existential threats that, that face us? Um, so, so that's, that's kind of the question. That's kind of why we're interested in monetary, modern monetary theory. Uh, there's a lot more that we could say about how money works in the present. Um, and we can get to that, I think, especially since maybe we won't be able to discuss Richard II so much until next time. We can talk about that uh, later. Um, um, but the point of my seminar, what I really want to show you is that we might be missing something if we only think about how money works in the present and don't think about how money works in the past, right? So I want to kind of suggest to you that the past really, really matters um, for the way that, that money works and we, and we can't ignore it, right? So most people kind of have a story about money um, according to which money at some point becomes modern. We now have the modern monetary system and it leaves behind the way that things work in the past, right? For example, you know, we might hear that once upon a time, um, gold was, I mean, money was gold um, and it is no longer gold. And so because it's no longer gold, we can't run out. Right? That's one kind of story you might hear. Um, but I, I'm going to try to suggest to you that um, we haven't left behind the past of money as much as we might um, want to imagine. Okay. Um, so the origin of the modern monetary system is often located in 1694. Um, 1694 is when the Bank of England was founded. Um, and this is when, as Christine Besson argues, uh, this is when the fiat loop was closed. So this is sort of the true origin of fiat money for her, even though they kind of pretended like it was a gold standard. Um, but for her, it's really, it is fiat money um, because the uh, floating public debt of the English states, right? So the English debt state begins to float a public debt, which it never pays off. It's a long-term debt. And this debt itself becomes the money of the English people. And this is a, this is a very important revolution in, in the history of money um, because it really frees the state from the constraint of needing to come up with uh, bullion supplies in order to, to, to create money because instead we can just use, we can just use paper. And, um, and so, and so the, the Bank of England was founded in the wake of what is called the Glorious Revolution of 1688, um, which was the end of the Stuart dynasty. We're going to be talking a lot more about the Stuart dynasty um, as, as we go on. Um, and in addition, the part of this revolution in the monetary system um, is the great recoinage of 1696. So the bank is founded in 1694. And in 1696, they undertake this vast effort to recoin um, the English money, which had was in a, a bad state, um, essentially because of, of clipping and wear and things like that, right? So there's this, um, so the English uh, 17th century has civil war, it has a lot of strife, there's not, a, the money supply suffers from all of these things, and they want to recoin the money in order to put the monetary system on a stable foundation once again. Um, what is unusual about the great recoinage is that it is essentially the first time in history that the state paid the liquidity premium, okay? So prior to 1696 and the great recoinage, the way that minting works, the way that the production of coinage worked is that merchants would voluntarily bring bullion to the mint and they would receive coins um, which were valuable to them because they were more liquid than bullion. They're easy to, easier to spend and to use. And the merchants would pay some amount of their bullion to the state. So the state would take a cut, um, which is called seniorage. Okay. And in a way, the state is charging the merchants um, for supplying them with a service. And the service is that they get to turn their bullion into coins. Now, what happens in the great recoinage is something deeply important for the constitution of the modern monetary system. 
which is that the state pays the liquidity premium. The state taxed, raised tax revenue in order to provide, in order to pay the costs of minting coins to provide them to the public as a free good, okay? So the English state moved from um, taxing by charging the liquidity premium, which is what it had been doing for uh, uh, eight, 800 years prior to this, eight or 900 years. Um, and it moved into taxing in order to pay the liquidity premium, okay? And the reason that this matters is that we can understand what happens in events like 2008 as the state paying the liquidity premium, okay? So all of a sudden, uh, the liquidity starts to vanish from the financial system. The liquidity that is created by private money creation, um, there's a run on the bank and the state ste steps up and uses its power in order to backstop the money system. And it pays a price um, to do so. And this price is the liquidity premium, okay? So we now live in a constitutional order in which it is assumed that money is something that the state supplies to the public as a free good, okay? And this is not how things used to be. This really only comes into being at the end of the English 17th century with the Glorious Revolution, the founding of the Bank of England and the, the Great Recoinage, okay? So, um, so here we've arrived at kind of a key concept um, that I wanna try to develop in this seminar and that you will, as you go read Richard II after this seminar, I uh, hope you will see it in Richard II. Okay, and this, this concept is what I call sovereign servility. Okay, and what I mean by this um, is, is this gesture of the sovereign exercising its sovereign power in order to empty itself of its own sovereignty. Okay, so one way that we can understand, there's a lot of details to this, take my word for it for the moment, and I can, we can talk about the details in the discussion. Um, one way to understand what happened in 2008 is that the private banking sector was able to use derivatives technology in order to produce counterfeit US debt, okay? So essentially they're producing assets that are identical to US treasury bonds that trade at the same price and are the same asset in every sense, except for the fact that they aren't real, that they aren't really guaranteed by, by the Fed. And what happened in 2008 is that the Fed chose to recognize this fake US money as real money in order to ex so it exercised its own sovereignty to swap these fake, fake US assets with real US assets in order to prop up the financial system. So the sovereign kind of recognized counterfeit money as though it were its own money. And I'm interested in this gesture of the sovereign kind of emptying itself of its own power willingly, like the sovereign willingly dies and sacrifices itself in order to save the monetary system. And I, where does this come from, right? This is the question. Um, so, and, and, so my, and so what I wanna to suggest to you is that this mode of sovereignty was, was developed in the English 17th century over the course of a, of a fairly violent and bloody political history. And what it eventually you know, led to was the situation in which the, the sovereign pledges, pledges itself to accept its own liabilities at, at par, um, rather than using its sovereignty to enhance the money, to, to debase the money, to declare that its value is higher than it was before, um, either for its own benefit, um, for fiscal policy, right? or for the purposes of monetary policy. So I, I'm gonna, part of what I'm gonna be arguing to you is that um, in the medieval period and the early modern periods, um, states did engage in both fiscal and monetary policy through the coinage. So they used the coinage to raise revenue um, so that they could field armies and things like that. And, but they also used the money in order to conduct what we would now call monetary policy. So um, one example of that is uh, after um, Henry VIII debased the money in, in the 1540s, um, there was a big boom of English cloth trade. Um, I'm going to talk more about the English cloth trade in, in a little bit. Um, but the result of this sort of constitutional development of sovereign servility is that we get a sovereign which is characterized by simultaneous omnipotence and impotence. Okay, so the sovereign is both at once omnipotent, it can do anything, and impotent, it can do nothing. Right? And MMT tends to focus on the, on the omnipotence part of this, okay? MMT says the sovereign is not bound by their own provinces. The sovereign can print money out of nothing. The sovereign is omnipotent, 
Okay, but, but how do we actually see the sovereign behaving? We actually see the sovereign behaving as though it is impotent, right? The sovereign says to us, we have no money. You know, we can't even buy ventilators to save people from Corona. You know, we're running out of money. There's nothing to be done, right? So the sovereign presents itself as, as impotent. Um, but at the same time, the financial system needs the sovereign to be omnipotent in order to save it from things like 2008, right? So how, how can this be? Um, okay, so uh, before the English monetary system could arrive at this point, it had to pass through uh, the, the violent 17th century, um, through civil war against parliament, um, who are really kind of domestic creditors, and, and the Glorious Revolution, in which uh, uh, William of Orange was brought over uh, by parliament from the Netherlands in order to um, become the new king. Um, and, and so what we have leading up to this development in English constitution is the Stuart dynasty, which lasted from 1603 to 1688. Um, and the Stuart dynasty was characterized by struggles with parliament, um, their domestic creditors, um, because James I, uh, who, exceeded, who succeeded Elizabeth in 1603, um, inherited not only her crown, but also her debts. Okay, many of these debts were owed to her own subjects. Um, and this was the result of a conscious political project um, that Elizabeth undertook along with her finance minister, Thomas Gresham. Um, so Elizabeth was very worried about her dependence on foreign money markets. So on, in Antwerp, there's a money market and you can go borrow money, and, but this makes you um, um, subject to, to foreign, foreign creditors. And so they attempted to stimulate domestic credit markets including the founding of the Royal Exchange in 1571, which was very explicitly a project about trying to do this, about trying to, to develop domestic credit markets. Um, but the problem is that Elizabeth spends most of her reign um, kind of more or less succeeding at dealing with the really terrible financial situa situation that was left to her by her father, uh, Henry VIII. Um, and, but the problem is that James, when he succeeds uh, her, never never runs a surplus his entire time in, in, in his entire reign, okay? So James, uh, Elizabeth um, had mostly run a surplus during peacetime and a deficit during wartime. And the debt is sort of the accumulation of uh, what's called extraordinary expenditures. Um, one of the texts that I meant to assign you for this time and we'll talk, we'll explain to you about um, James's deficit finance. So James is really the first European monarch to run perpetual peacetime deficits. So even when he's at peace, his government is in deficit. This is a feature of the modern state, right? All modern states are always in deficit. Modern states don't really run surpluses unless they're forced to um, by weird Eurozone rules and things like that, which is a whole problem, right? They're not meant to run uh, uh, surpluses. They're meant to run deficits. It's a constitutional feature of the modern state. And we first see this emerge um, in the early 17th century with, with James I. Um, now, uh, there's a couple of reasons uh, for this. Uh, the first reason and the, sort of the most traditional reason is that James liked to spend money and, and party. Okay, uh, maybe, um, but there's kind of more important structural reasons. The, the first reason is that the 16th century saw um, a great inflation, a great secular inflation. Um, it's called the early modern price revolution in which um, prices increased by four to 10 times over the course of the century. Um, and because the crown's revenues were often pegged to some kind of nominal value, this inflation really hurt the, um, the ability of the crown. The crown was very limited in its ability to uh, get new revenues. Um, uh, the English crown didn't really have vast powers of taxation. There's no income tax or anything like that. It's pretty limited in its ability to raise revenues. And these revenues are being eroded uh, in real terms by the inflation. Um, and the other reason, um, so, okay, so, so, so the, the James is unable to, to pay these debts. They are eventually uh, repudiated by his son, Charles I, shortly before the Civil War breaks out and Charles gets his head cut off, okay? So in, in important ways, these legacy debts from Elizabeth were an important cause of the English Civil War. Um, things were also made worse for James by what is called the slump of the 1620s in which the uh, English cloth export trade was being very greatly harmed, okay? So as I said a little bit earlier, uh, Henry VIII um, debased the money um, rather famously in the 1540s. 
And this led to a great stimulation of the cloth trade because as the English money falls in value on international uh, money markets, English cloth gets cheaper and everybody wants to buy it. And so um, there's this huge stimulation of, and England really became um, structurally dependent on, on the cloth export trade. Um, but Elizabeth uh, end, ends up recoining the money after she takes the throne and sticks with it, right? She refuses to, um, to debase the money. And the problem is that everybody around them in, uh, on, in, in France, uh, other continental powers are engaging in competitive debasements of their coinage, right? So everybody else is debasing their money. It has very little silver in it. Uh, meanwhile, the English are committed to this hard money standard. They're, they're refusing to debase their money. And this leads to a very high value of English money on the foreign exchange and thus a slump in, in the cloth trade. And this is another big problem for the English crown's uh, financial position because they depend a lot on customs revenue for, for the cloth. So this slump of the 1620s led to a debate in Parliament um, between a guy named Gerard de Malines, um, who was probably involved in, in uh, Elizabeth's recoinage, and a guy named Thomas Munn. Um, and the, the debate was essentially about whether um, you could fix the balance of trade by fixing the foreign exchanges, or whether instead you should fix the foreign exchanges by fixing the balance of trade, okay? So um, Malines is essentially arguing that, you know, the problem is that all of these other states around us are debasing their money, our money is too expensive, therefore our cloth is too expensive and nobody can buy it, and that's why we're seeing this horrible slump um, in, in, the, in the cloth industry. And he says, so the answer is obvious, we should debase the money, right? We should lower, we should intentionally lower the value of English money on international exchanges in order to stimulate the cloth trade, okay? Thomas Munn argues the opposite position. Thomas Munn argues that the only way that we can fix the valuation of the English money on foreign exchanges is by fixing the balance of trade. So essentially we have to export, we have to, we have to, make more cloth, we have to export more cloth, we have to earn more foreign uh, exchange, and it's only in this way that we can correct um, the, the exchanges. This debate is really important because it is Thomas Munn's position that essentially sovereign power to intervene into its own money cannot be used as a way to stimulate the economy, okay? He argues basically that it would be sterile, right? You can try to do it, but the economy, it won't really work, right? I mean, it's just an illusory power. Um, and so Thomas Munn is in important ways the, um, the origin of this idea of the economy as being a kind of autonomous thing, um, which the state can't really intervene into. The state will ultimately be powerless to intervene into it because it has its own logic, um, that will, that will work itself out in the way that it will, no matter what you try to do, right? This is a very powerful idea um, that people on both the right and the left in, in modern discourses really believe in very powerfully, right? So if you see people on the left arguing against MMT, um, they are really the intellectual uh, descendants of, Tom, of Thomas Munn, okay? Um, so um, the point is that Munn's victory in this debate was an ideological victory and not a scientific one. Right? The Stuarts really could have devalued their silver money in order to fight back against the competitive debasements that were surrounding them, just like Henry VIII did in the 1540s. Okay? Um, so what you see here, and, and, and so as a result of this debate, uh, Charles Stuart is not able to devalue the money, um, and he can never pay back his debt, and the position of the crown just erodes and erodes until eventually there's a civil war. Okay. So what's interesting here is that we have parliament representing a domestic creditor class, which is willing to sacrifice its own economy, okay? It's willing to strangle its own cloth trade under hard money in order to pursue an internal class struggle, okay? So parliament does not want the money to be devalued because this will erode the value of the debt that they own. And they are willing to defend that even to the point of destroying the domestic civil society and, and bringing on civil war, okay? So they're so opposed to the power of sovereignty to intervene into the credit system that they're, that they're willing to do this. Okay, so, so this brings us to Richard II, um, which is a play that Shakespeare wrote in the last decade of Elizabeth's reign. 
Um, and Elizabeth famously identified herself with Shakespeare's depiction of Richard II. She said, I am Richard II. Don't you know that to somebody? I forget who. Um, so this play has been uh, kind of famously invoked by Kantorovich in, in his book, uh, The King's Two Bodies, which you may be familiar with. Um, this book introduces the distinction between the king's body natural and his body politic, right? The king's body natural is his ordinary body as a, as a man. His body politic is his supernatural spiritual body as the king. And, and as Kantorovich argues, these become separated in, in sort of the early modern period. Um, this discussion has a, a lot of relevance for monetary history um, because in order for floating long-term public debt to become possible, the debt has to be safe, uh, which means safe from default risk. And lending to the sovereign in their body natural, lending to Richard II, the man, um, is pretty risky. Uh, first of all, because he's the king and he can do what he wants. So what recourse do you have if he decides to repudiate his debt? Well, you don't really have any, okay? This is a problem that frames the beginning of Richard II. Um, and, and he also might die and not pay you back. And then you have this whole question of whether the successor to the king will pay the debts back or not, right? Which is a question that dominates Shakespeare's time, right? The question of it. So Elizabeth has no children. Um, she's not going to have any children. And there's this question of who will succeed Elizabeth and will the debt be safe? This is a major political question in the, in the late 16th century. Um, so it's only by introducing this idea of, of the immortal body politic of the king that we can create the floating long-term debt that is the basis of the modern monetary uh, system. Um, so this is kind of, that's all kind of well known. Um, and I, so I'm not gonna retread that. Um, but what we can add to this story um, is that the deposition of Richard II in 1399, which this play dramatizes, is also a watershed moment in English monetary history because it represented the end of a hard money policy which had been pursued by what's called the Plantagenet dynasty um, for over 200 years before Richard II is deposed, okay? So Richard II is the direct male heir of Henry II. Um, he's his great, 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 great grandson or something like this. And for the, so there's, um, and, and for this entire dynasty, which lasts about 220 years, um, after Henry II introduces what's called the short cross penny in 1180. Um, this sets a, a penny weight uh, standard by weight, and they did not deviate from this for over 200 years, despite the fact that all around them, everybody is releasing a, a base money. And this has the consequence that money flows out of England. So if you are issuing a, a hard money, and you're surrounded by base money, um, the hard money will tend to be melted down, exported, driven out of circulation. So essentially, the English state is throwing, uh, you know, pure silver English pennies into circulation, and they flow uh, straight over the channel to France. Um, now, this works out for them uh, for a good long while because the Hundred Years' War is going on, and the English are going over to, uh, to France and taking all the silver back, right? So the, the money flows across the channel because of the bullion drain, and then it flows back to England because of the Hundred Years' War. And in this way, they're kind of able to maintain the, the monetary system. Um, but this all kind of starts to fall apart uh, around the time of Richard's reign for various reasons, one of which is um, that uh, Richard's father, Edward the Black Prince, who was kind of in charge of the war, dies. And along with a bunch of his other generals and the war kind of starts to go against the English. And all of a sudden, um, the crown starts to experience immense fiscal distress. Um, and what, what happens is that Richard uh, farms his lands. So he uh, basically farming your lands, which you'll read a lot about in Richard II, basically involves uh, allowing some private party to collect the revenue, right? So Richard says, I have all these lands, but I need money now. So I'm going to kind of sell and advance the future revenues of, of my lands to, to, to these cronies that I have who are going to become these tax farmers and who end up really hated by, by kind of by, by the public. So Richard II is selling off his assets. He's farming his lands. He's doing all of this stuff in order to try to 
to save his fiscal position. But what he never does is debases the money. Richard never debases the money. He never abandons this hard money standard that had been in, in, in effect for 220 years. Um, it is only abandoned after the deposition of Richard II. So after Henry, Henry uh, Bolingbroke deposes Richard II, which is the events that are dramatized in Shakespeare's play, um, they uh, immediately start um, releasing base money in order essentially to compete with the um, surrounding uh, money. And what, what's interesting is, I mean, the king has to be deposed in order to make this possible, right? So there's some sort of immense political pressure against debasing the money, which is in some ways unique to England. Other, other um, societies around them don't seem to experience this same kind of uh, state of class struggle or whatever it is internally that, that makes this necessary. So, so after the deposition of Richard II, we get a period of debasements. There's the War of the Roses in which the House of York and the House of Lancaster uh, fight each other for the, um, for, the, for the throne of Richard II. Uh, until they are, the war is finally ended by uh, Henry Tudor, Henry VII, who unites the, the claims and he restores the coinage. So Richard II, I mean, sorry, Henry, the, uh, Henry VII um, um, gets the throne, restores the coinage. Uh, his son, Henry VIII, debases the coinage. His daughter, Elizabeth I, restores the coinage. And it's at that point that the English money more or less remains unchanged until World War I. Um, through all of its all of its history, and this is the period in which Shakespeare is writing. Um, but the so 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 the punchline of all of this is that the dynamics, the fiscal dynamics, which would eventually lead to the fall of the Stuarts and the Civil War, uh, were already in play in the time of Elizabeth. Uh, the great 16th century inflation was already eroding her revenues. Um, she was borrowing lots of money um, on short term short term debt, not long term debt. Um, she was selling off and farming crown lands. Of course, her father, Henry VIII, had seized all the lands of the monasteries and, and thrown them into circulation or to raise revenue. Um, Elizabeth did things like force her, her uh, subjects to loan her money and then never paid it back. Um, and she did all of this despite the fact that she never, she, once she recoined the money, she never, she never debased it. And, and the Stuarts were also prevented from, from debasing it. And, and she had to do this essentially in order to uh, maintain her credibility on, on money markets because people wouldn't want to loan her money if they were afraid that they would be paid back in uh, uh, debased coins, okay? So there is essentially a kind of dynamic between uh, England and these continental mints in which the continental mints are competitively debasing and England is paying the price to avoid debasing by selling off everything that belongs to the crown <laughs> and um, and permanently indebting indebting the crown, right? And and so this is the um, kind of the dilemma of of hard money that eventually gives rise to the modern monetary system based upon the the permanent floating debt um, of the crown. Okay. So um, what I kind of want to begin by talking about, and maybe we can talk more about it next time, um, is this parallel between the reigns of Elizabeth and Richard. Um, in that they both represent a rupture in the succession, right? So Elizabeth is the end of the Tudor dynasty. The, uh, Richard is the end of the, the main branch of the Plantagenet dynasty. And they also uh, dramatize the dilemma of hard money, this, this, this problem of kind of as, as William Jennings Bryan would put it in American history, um, um, crucifying yourself on a, on a cross of gold, except in this case, it's, it's silver. Okay. Can we... Um, um... Yeah, and I'm, 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 I'm wrapping up now. We can begin the discussion. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so, so this is kind of my introduction to the historical context of, of Richard II. Um, and so now I kind of want to open it up to discussion. And uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll see what you have. There's some passages of the play that I want to look at. Um, but yeah, I'm, let's take some questions now. I was just more curious if we could, um, what, what is, what's an example of how basic currency is being debased? Because I feel like I heard that term a lot, but I'm not sure exactly what that like, mm -hmm. what, what that means. means. Yeah, what that actually means. Mm -hmm. Okay, great question. Great question. Um, so, okay, let me let me begin by saying this. Um, there is something called Gresham's law. So Gresham's law is is named after um, probably uh, wrongly the finance minister of Elizabeth I, Thomas Gresham. So Thomas Gresham is the guy whose job it is 
to go to Antwerp and, and try to get money for the queen. And Gresham's law states that bad money drives out good. Um, so if there are two monies in an economy and one of them is a good money and the other one is a bad money, um, it's pretty obvious. So suppose that you have two coins in your pocket and you're trying to decide which one to spend. And one of them has a lot of silver and the other one has not very much silver. You're going to spend the one with not very much silver and you're going to keep the one that has a lot of silver, right? So, so good money will tend to be driven out. Um, what this means is that there is necessarily a difference between the nominal value of the coin, its legal value, and its intrinsic value, its, its value as bullion. There must be a difference between these two prices of money, because if there weren't, if the intrinsic value ever rose to the nominal value, it would cease to be money. It would be hoarded, melted down, exported, driven out of circulation in various ways, okay? So, so money must have less metal in it than the name of imply. Now, there are various ways in which this happens. So how does the nominal and intrinsic value of the coin diverge? Well, if you read Marx, Marx thinks that it's purely accidental, right? So Marx thinks in, in Capital, if you read what he says about the medieval monetary system, that he kind of imagines that money is, is made originally uh, uh, full-bodied and then kind of through wear and tear as it circulates through the economy, um, it loses its intrinsic value. And this is a very important way that, um, that money loses intrinsic value. There's various processes. So one is just wear and tear, just coins jingle around in your pocket, little bits of silver fall off. You do this for 80 years and the coin is, is now has less silver um, in it. Um, people also clip um, little bits of silver. They do something called sweating where you, you get a bag and a bunch of coins and you shake them up and little bits of silver come out. Um, so there are, so those are ways in which coins can be, can become bad money. Um, but coins can also be made bad money by the action of the minting authority itself. And the, there's essentially three ways in which this is accomplished. Um, one is called debasement. So debasement is when a base metal is mixed in with the precious metal in order to dilute the precious metal content of the coin. So I say, you know, here's this much silver, but really it's got some lead in it and stuff. And the lead is cheaper than the silver. So if I'm the king, I can pocket the extra silver by debasing my coin. Um, and I, I hope, so you notice, I want you to notice as you read Richard II, the term base appears over and over and over and over again in the play. So I want you to, I want you to watch out for that. I mean, we'll talk about it next time. Um, so, so that is debasement. Um, which is kind of a more sneaky way of lowering the intrinsic value of the coin because it's kind of supposed to disguise the fact that there's less silver in it. Okay. Coins can also be lightened. So they can be made simply with less silver without debasing. And this is kind of a more honest uh, over on the table way to reduce the intrinsic value of a coin. Um, and they can also be cried up. So the king can just make an announcement one day that this coin that used to be worth one pound is now worth one pound and one shilling or, or something like that, right? So, so these, those are kind of the three major ways in which um, sovereignty can intervene into the money in order to regulate its intrinsic, intrinsic content. Right? So that's, that's debasement. Any, any other questions about, about anything, about, um, about the, the medieval history or we can, I mean, we can, I, my, my plan was to not talk as much about the modern system in MMT um, today, but since we, had a trouble with the readings, we can we can do that if, if you like. Colin. Yes. I have a question. Can you also reflect upon modern ways of debasing that takes place not necessarily through like the old classic coinage, but through credit and all that? Because I think that would be a good way of like understanding debasing continues on, right? Yeah. Well question. So in a way, we live in a system with only base money. So, so we don't have any good money in our entire monetary system in, in one way of speaking, right? So we do not have any kind of money 
that is backed by um, precious metal, by some kind of like intrinsic commodity standard. Um, in a sense, um, the result of World War II and the resulting US hege uh, monetary hegemony over the world was to drive out all of the good money and replace it with bad money that the, that the US issues. So in a way we don't have, so, so we no longer have this difference between the nominal and intrinsic value of the money in the same way that it operated in the medieval monetary system. But of course, if you start talking about expansionary fiscal policy. If you start talking about MMT and you start talking about how um, you know, the, the state is not really limited by money and what it can spend, um, people will say that you're debasing the money. Um, and, 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 and the question is, you know, what, does that, what does that really um, mean? Is it debasing? People will say yes, people will say no. Um, the question becomes how do we establish some sort of some sort of standard for, for measuring how much money is worth. And this is a really deeply tricky problem. I mean, you when you look at graphs of, of like the value of money, you know, there's these inflation calculators. So you can say, you know, you plug it into this website and it says, oh, you know, $100 today is the same as this amount of money in the past or, or whatever. Um, the problem is that in order to establish that, um, you need to create an inflation index, which requires um, constructing a normative subject, which desires and enjoys in, in my language. So, I mean, you need to say like, what do you want? Um, because, because the consumption basket changes so much over time. So we can, it's, a, it's kind of a, a deep question. Um, you know, so like, how do we measure the, the value of money? But another way that we could kind of think about this question, and I think a way that is more interesting as a political question of the kind that I'm trying to get at is that, so once we realize that money just is the debt of the state and that both dollars and US bonds are debt of the state. And so they are both forms of money. The question is, what is the relationship between a treasury bond and a dollar, right? And what's interesting is that the Federal Reserve can intervene into the monetary system in order to manage the prices of these two kinds of money separately. Um, and this is rather like the way that states manage the relationship between gold and silver in a bimetallic monetary system. So um, in, in, in various kinds of, of uh, sometimes it's silver and sometimes it's gold, depending on the period. In the, in the Roman empire, it's gold that is the good money um, in England, in our period that we're looking at now, it's, it's silver. Um, silver is the good money. And, 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 and the point is that you can regulate the value of these two different monies independently. So we can take the bad money and we can reduce how much it's worth in terms of good money. And so um, one way that we can kind of think about debasement is the fact that the Federal Reserve kind of pledges to defend the value of bonds relative to dollars, right? So, the, so this is what the Federal Reserve does when it creates money out of nothing in order to buy back state debt, is it's trying to raise the value of bonds in terms of dollars, which is, to my mind, and this is one of the things that I'm still trying to think through, I mean, to my mind is very much like um, the, so, so when, when the English state cries up the value of gold in order to regulate gold as a kind of bad money um, in relation to silver, which is a kind of good money. Um, so I would say that, you know, where, where do we see debasement now? I mean, we see debasement in the, the, the way that the monetary authority is able to regulate the different kinds of money that different kinds of people use separately from one another, right? So bonds are the money of rich people that's good money. Dollars are the money of poor people. That's bad money. And in a way, the, the state being able to defend the good money um, uh, it, it, you know, without reference to the bad money is, is a kind of form of debasement, right? There's a question in the chat. Um, so there's a question in the chat, is inflation, is inflation a form of debasement of, of fiat money? Um, uh, that is the view that you'll often, that you'll often see. Um, but I don't, I, I, it's important for us. So it's important for us not to confuse inflation and, and debasement. And here's the reason why. Um, 
The reason is that debasement is often a response to inflation. Debasement is a policy response to inflation. So the typical story that you will hear about monetary history is that money naturally wants to be good money. This is sort of the natural form of money. And the only way that money becomes bad is for states to intervene into it, to debase it. Um, and it is almost always represented as being motivated by revenue, right? So the king is greedy, he wants to get money, and this is why he debases the money. Um, the truth of it is, is much more complicated, which is that it seems very likely to me that revenue motivated debasements are fairly unusual. It's not the case that kings usually debase the money in order to get revenue. They debase the money in order to keep it in circulation and also to meet the demands of the public for more money. So in the 20th century, kind of after uh, these hyperinflationary episodes that, that you've surely heard of, we, we're uh, accustomed to think that the problem is that there would be too much money, that the government would create too much money. Um, this has never been the problem for all for most of history. The problem for most of history, in, in Europe at least, um, is that there wasn't enough money. And so there's kind of a universal consensus that um, the king should do something about getting more money into the economy. Um, and, and so as inflation drives up the price of things, um, there's a demand for more money and there's only so much silver to go around. And so the, 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 the king might actually debase the money just so that he can create more of it um, in order to meet the demands of the public for, for more money. Um, and so, so essentially debasement is, is, can often be, be driven by inflation as a necessary response to inflation um, because, because kind of the real problem um, for most of history was that the money was too expensive and, and, uh, and that uh, debts because because debts have to be paid back in money if if the if the money is not debased then um, everybody kind of gets swallowed up by their debts and it destabilizes the social order and so and so I think it's important to distinguish between um, uh, debasement and, and inflation um, precisely because debasement um, is often a, a, a policy response to to inflation that, that's necessary um, in, in order for states to to carry out let's see. Um, let's see, more questions. Also wondering, aren't lower interest rates money by Fed a, a modern form of debasing? Um, right, so, so I mean, these, these are all the questions, right? I mean, the, the questions are when the, when the state exercises its monetary sovereignty, when the Fed prints money out of nothing, isn't this really a form of, of debasement, right? I mean, this is sort of the general thrust of, of the questions. Um, what, I'm, what I wanna suggest, okay, let me. So there's been a, I talked about this if you were on the call um, a couple of days ago, I talked a little bit about this. So I'm gonna reiterate some of my points. Um, there's been sort of this, so in, in the wake of COVID, right? Everybody knows uh, Federal Reserve has been shoveling trillions of dollars of, of money every day into financial markets um, in order to keep them, to keep them liquid. And, and the question has been, you know, isn't this MMT, right? Doesn't this prove that MMT is, is right? Aren't we basically doing MMT um, by doing this? And part of what my narrative is trying to show, to suggest to you is that uh, this is not doing MMT. And if anything, it's kind of the opposite, <laughs> right? So, so if anything, I would say that um, the recent regime of low interest rates from the Fed is actually not a form of debasement. It's the opposite. It's a form of refusal to debase and it is a, a desperate attempt to avoid debasing, debasing the money, right? This is what I'm trying to, trying to show you. So, so what is the Fed doing when it lowers interest rates? What the Fed is doing when it lowers interest rates is trying to increase the value of bonds, okay? That's it. So bonds, the, the price of bonds and the interest rate of bonds have an inverse relation with one another by definition, right? So the higher the price of the bond, um, the lower the interest rate. Um, and so when the Federal Reserve is printing money 
in, in the way that it prints money in order to lower interest rates by buying bonds. So the Fed buys bonds to raise the price of the bonds and thus lower the interest rates. What it is trying to do, kind of my analysis suggests, is to defend the price of good money, right? If the, if the bonds are really the good money of the system, what the Fed is doing is not debasing the money. It's actually desperately trying to avoid allowing the money to be debased. Um, the question is, like, why doesn't the federal, why can't we use the same power to create money to engage in like things like infrastructure projects, right? I mean, like, why can't we do real stuff? You know, I mean, we're, we're in this situation now where you know, our, our government thinks they can fight a pandemic with the central bank, um, which is nuts because the central bank doesn't employ doctors, you know? So, so why is it that we have infinite money to save financial markets from a panic and we have no money to, you know, build hospitals, hire doctors, things like this? Well, I mean, my answer to you is that as long as the Federal Reserve just shovels money into the top of the banking system, it shovels money into what's called the primary dealer market, which is where sort of most of the money that we use is really created. Um, it is preventing the good money from being, uh, from losing value. But if it were to spend money into the economy in order to hire people to do real things, this would be what they call inflation, right? So in one way, what they call inflation is ordinary people getting richer because now they have more money. I mean, that's kind of what they, that's kind of what they mean by inflation. And so, what I'm kind of trying to suggest to you is that there is a deep genealogical reason about the modern constitution that really kind of arises, I think, out of this English political history, according to which we can use our infinite power over money to defend the value of the good money. And we must do this no matter what, even if it has deleterious social consequences, even if it leads us to the brink of civil war, um, but what we can't do is use that same power in order to, uh, to, to do fiscal spending, right? In order to, to hire an army of, of some kind, whether it's an army with guns or an army with, with medical supplies. Does that, does, does that, does that, uh, address your question? Um, I don't know. I'm talking about you. Can I ask um... Okay, go ahead. Colin, do you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so can I ask about um, like, uh, like, you know, if you read like David Harvey or whatever, just like, you know, you hear like um, Bretton Woods as like this, this like essential moment in the development of money or whatever, modern money in the modern state. And so I'm wondering like, like, and I, my sense is that this is maybe one of the larger questions for the class, but like, sovereignty like if we're trying to understand like a modern model of sovereignty with this knowledge um then who gets to debase like do i get to debase my disney dollars for my stuffed animal collection uh and does that mean my like 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 it, it's how do we situate debasement and like the sovereignty to debase or not debase like within a geopolitical context um and is there a way to like map that trajectory from uh, medieval Europe to to what happens with Bretton Woods and and, and whatever what we see now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, I mean the sort of the point of these monetary uh, these monetary agreements, these international monetary agreements, kind of the point of them is to prevent states from debasing. I mean that is kind of um, so in 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 the, you know who gets to debase according to uh, you know, sort of the, 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 the ruling, the theory that rules the world. I mean, the answer is nobody. Nobody's supposed to be debate, speed debased. And that's supposed to be like the ultimate thing that nobody is allowed, is allowed to be doing. Um, so, I mean, like, you know, uh, like the Eurozone is all, that's what the Eurozone is about, right? So, I mean, what you have in the Eurozone is you have a situation in which, um, you know, you've, you've prevented peripheral countries, you know, Spain, Italy, all these places from, from debasing their money which is what they need to be doing in order to restore some kind of competitive parity with the German export economy, right? I mean, what they really need to do is have a separate money that they can lower the value of um, 
in the same way that Henry VIII lowered the value of his money, stimulated the export of cloth, and, and helped kind of fix the balance of, of payments between, the, between uh, England and, and its trading partners. And, and what you have in sort of these 20th century uh, monetary constitutions, which is really what Bretton Woods is as a, as a constitution, is a, a, a law that is over and above sovereignty that binds sovereignty from the ability to intervene into its own money, right? And this is, this is the question, right? So in Richard II, the problem is that there is no law above Richard. Richard is the king, there is no law. He, he decides he does what he wants to do. And this is kind of the reason that he has to, that, 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 he, that he has to fall. Um, the problem is that as we'll see in, in the later plays, um, the lack of a, of a law over sovereignty is also a problem because if the king can debase, then what's to prevent him from just sort of doing this as much as he, as much as he wants, right? I mean, this is, this is the problem. So, so, so the, there is a common sense. What I'm, what I'm trying to do is to intervene into a certain kind of common sense about money. The common sense about money is that debasement is bad. Debasement creates inflation. If you start debasing, if you start printing your money, you'll be Venezuela, you'll be, you'll, you know, um, and what I'm trying to kind of show is that there is also a hard money dilemma. Like uh, you can't really peg yourself to some kind of hard money standard and totally get rid of the ability of sovereignty to intervene, um, essentially because this ultimately destabilizes the credit system, right? So, uh, so, so, so the problem is, that, that debts grow exponentially without any reference to the real economy. The real economy is subject to volatility. Things go wrong, things don't work, there's volatility. You know, debt doesn't, you know. So, you know, right now there's a lot of discourse um, about, about landlords, right? So the problem is everybody, no, everybody lost their job, nobody can pay and the landlords are like, well, rent is still due. Okay, because the, the landlords have no equity, right? It's just debt, right? What they own is your debt. So it doesn't matter what's happening to you in your real life and your real economy, you still owe the same amount of money. Um, and the problem is that this kind of inevitably happens, right? Debt inevitably grows faster than the ability to service debt in the economy. And one solution to this is to debase the money, right? So debasing the money is a solution to debt crisis because if I debase the money, make money worth less, then it becomes easier for everybody to pay off their debt, right? So, so you know, so we were talking the other day about Germany handing five thousand euros to everybody so that they can pay their rent. This is so. I mean, this is a kind of form of debasement. Perhaps we we could say. So, I mean, so I mean, maybe the answer to our question is helicopter money is where debasement happens today because what you're doing is preventing this debt bubble from collapsing by issuing new money. Um, which essentially creates what's called unit of account inflation. So debts are denominated in units of account. If the value of the unit of account falls because there's more money in the economy, then the real value of everybody's debts goes down. And this is a way that you can solve a debt crisis without abolishing debt. Um, this would be a different seminar that I could give. But if, if, I, if I gave a seminar about some of my research um, about the Roman Empire, which I, I can talk about just very briefly. I mean, this is how the Romans solved this problem. The Romans um, had secular silver debasement over hundreds of years. And my argument is that this is what allowed them to roll over debt crises without um, having de general debt abolition. So like, it's a, it's a way to prevent a jubilee, right? So the other answer is we say, nobody has to pay rent anymore, you know, or like for, for this amount of time, you know, gen general rent amnesty. Well, why don't they want to do that? They don't want to do that because it threatens to totally abolish the entire social order, right? I mean, if we say, oh, we can just stop paying rent, you know, nobody has to pay rent anymore. And then we go back and people say, okay, well, so, so why do we have to start paying rent again now? Like, remind me, right? I mean, so there's this idea that if you kind of openly get rid of debts, um, this is going to be a kind of slippery slope to the total leveling of, of all wealth in society. And you can kind of do it sneakily through unit of account inflation. Um, so I, I, hope, I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, so, 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 so yeah, I mean, you can in a way debase the, the money 
by, by just printing more of it, by just crediting people's accounts. Um, but I think it's important to understand that when the Federal Reserve prints money in order to save the financial system, to bid up assets rather than put it into the hands of people, it's kind of precisely not debasing the money. It's, it's really the opposite. Um, did that answer the question? I, I forget what exactly what the question was that I was responding to. Well, it's about like sovereignty, you know, like, um, huh. like uh, who who gets to, yeah, who gets to be the operator of these certain levers or whatever. Um, and I think I understand that it's a little bit more more complicated, or it's like unclear, or it's been obfuscated or something. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, I guess another way to answer the or ask the question, like in a, in a more direct way, is like, why can't um, you know why can't Iraq just like print a bunch of money and like be rich? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, and I know the question, like the, the my common sense would be that like, well, their currency is just valued far below the dollar, so they'd just be inflating. So then it would cost ten thousand Iraqi dollars to buy a loaf of bread or whatever. Uh -huh. um... Yeah. The, okay. So there is a, there's a really great book um, that's out recently by a guy named Jerome Roos, R-O-O-S. And the book is called Why Not Default? Um, and it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a, it's in a way it's about this question. Um, I mean, the answer is that like Iraq does not have a, Iraq is import dependent. I don't know a lot about the economy of Iraq in particular, but Iraq does not have a self-sustaining economy, at least not in the way that it's set up. Maybe perhaps it, it could, right? Um, but the fact that the Iraqi economy has an obligation to meet bills in outside money is what prevents it from having uh, monetary sovereignty. So um, there is something called uh, Mundell's trilemma, um, which I think is, is important to understand for some of this stuff. So um, Mundell is an American economist um, who's kind of thinking about the monetary system in the wake of World War II. And he posits a trilemma, um, which essentially states that there are three things that you might want to have as a monetary uh, issuer, and you can only have two of them, right? So you can have two um, but not all three. And the three things that you can have are uh, the free flow of capital, one. Uh, second, an independent fiscal policy. And three, price stability. So you can have free flow of capital, independent fiscal policy, or price stability, uh, but not all three. There's one that you have to give up. And the problem is that because uh, if you are a if you're, a, I'm going to call them colonized economies. If you're a colonized economy, you are dependent upon um, exporting maybe like one particular kind of thing. Maybe you're dependent on food exports. You're dependent on medicine imports or other things like this. The people that you're dealing with are not part of your legal monetary jurisdiction. Okay. So you, your state. So, so be, the point is that because you need the free flow of capital, you what, what, what Iraq basically has to give up in order to have price stability and the free flow of capital is an independent fiscal policy. So it's not really able to spend money and, and to intervene into its money, how it likes. Why? Because it is dependent on meeting bills and outside money. It has, it doesn't have the power to compel economic actors to accept its own money at nominal value in contracts, okay? So um, you will read about, and maybe you already did if you read the Boyer Zambo, um, there's a major question in legal history. Um, basically, so say I write somebody a contract and I say a year from now, I'm going to pay you 10 pounds. Now, the question is, what happens if the value of the money changes in between then and now? Am I allowed to pay you in the new bad coins or not, right? So if you are not part of a legal jurisdiction that I'm also a part of, then you might insist that I pay you in good money, right? So you say, I'm only going to take good money. I'm not going to take your bad money. 
if you're part of my jurisdiction and you say, I'm not going to take your bad money, I'm only going to take your good money, then I might take you to court. And I say, uh, well, you know, I owe William 10 pounds and here I have 10 pounds. It's legally 10 pounds, according to you, the king, and he's refusing to accept it. And they'll say, well, William, you know, you better take this money uh, or else, right? But if you're not part of the jurisdiction, then, then there's no, there is no um, capacity to force you to accept um, my money at nominal value in fulfillment of the contract, right? So, so if we're thinking about the question of, of monetary empire, um, which often comes out in discussions of MMT kind of as the thing that MMT is missing, right? Oh, hasn't MMT thought about, you know, the empire or MMT only works in the US or something like this, right? I mean, the deeper issue that is, that is lying under here is the question of what we could call a juridical force projection, right? So what is it that gives you the US the power to, um, to arbitrate international contracts in its own legal system? Right? So if the US can arbitrate international contracts in its own legal system, it has the power to impose its, its own definition of what money is. And Iraq lacks that power, right? I mean, nobody, nobody is forced to go to Iraqi courts in order to arbitrate contract disagreements and, and uh, answer this question about you know, whether I have to accept um, Iraqi money at, at face value or, or not. Um, so, so it really, I mean, it, so it really is a question of, of ge ge geopolitical power. Um, and, you know, and, and, and the point is, I mean, you know, we, we can, Iraq can say, you know, well, we're going to devalue our money. We're going to print all this money in order to do stuff. And, and they can do it as long as uh, international merchants that they deal with don't revolt against them. And, and kind of the point that I'm, that I want to make you consider is that this is really, this is a strategic question. It's a political and strategic question. It's not a purely objective technical question, which is how it will be represented in, in economics, right? So you might have, you know, uh, there might be structural racism in, in the way that these kind of things operate, right? I mean, like you might, um, international creditor cartels might exercise an increased amount of disciplinary power over countries they perceive to be uh, lesser in status, right? Then, you, you know, you might get more lenient treatments if you're a global North country um, and people will take your, your bad money, right? So there's a, there's, there's, there's a, it's, a it's about power and about, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's about strategic leverage, power, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, okay, uh, there's a question here uh, in the chat. Is sovereignty more distributed now as opposed to the, uh, the singular monarch? Um, so I think the best way to answer that question is to, is to kind of say, I mean, in a way, yes, the sovereignty in the monetary system has been kind of removed from the direct grasp of the executive power, right? And this is kind of what I'm suggesting that the modern monetary order regime is all about, is all about insulating monetary power from the executive and it's located in a couple of different places in our system today. Um, one is the Federal Reserve, which is obvious, right? The Federal Reserve is the one that has the power to create new dollars out of nothing. Um, but it's also located in, in, the, in the prime dealer market. Um, so the prime dealer market are really kind of the member banks of the Fed. They're the banks that created the Fed and the Fed is kind of run for their interest. Um, and they are the ones who really create most of the money that exists in our monetary system, right? So, so the money that you use, the money that's in your bank account is not um, really US dollars. It is dollar denominated deposits, right? So it's just a liability of your bank there and they don't really have all of that money, right? So they're, le they're leveraged up and, and this leverage eventually concentrates in the prime dealer market and, and it's the Fed's job to, to backstop them. So in, in a way, we might say that that sovereignty has been distributed um, to the prime dealer market um, in, in that they are the ones who kind of really have the power to create money. And they also have the power to essentially blackmail the state into, into saving them 
if they if they mess up right if they, if their if their if their books come in come into a, come into problem and, and this um in the united states this particular situation was kind of created by the civil war um essentially the uh the funding needs of the union um to get war material during the civil war um Basically, uh, Salmon P. Chase uh, begins by cornering all of the gold. He sucks all the gold out of the monetary system through a kind of trick. He ships all the gold off to Europe in exchange for guns and stuff. And then the gold's all gone and they still need money. Um, and so that is kind of when this prime dealer system is, is created. And so this seminar is not supposed to be primarily about the US monetary history. That's what we could, you know, we could study that uh, too. It's a little complicated story about the Civil War stuff. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that would be the answer. I mean, is that sovereignty really resides in in these prime dealer banks, which kind of have their position for historical reasons. I mean, they kind of they were they were kind of there during the Civil War when 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 they were really needed, and and for that reason, they have this privilege of of being able to deal directly with the Fed. Um, so so one interesting kind of political proposal that has been on the table recently. Um, partly because of uh, blockchain actually, but partly because of just uh, COVID and Corona and all this stuff is the idea of giving everybody, every citizen a account at the, at the Federal Reserve directly, making the Fed everybody's banker, um, which is interesting partly because it might really challenge the power of the, of, the, of the prime dealer banks to be the ones who get to decide how much money is in, is in the economy. So that's kind of my answer to that, to that question. Um, yeah, anything else? Um, I have some passages in Richard II that we could we could maybe maybe look at um, if people don't have more questions. But I'm I'm happy also to leave that for next time um, and just answer questions. But it depends on whether people have them or not. Colin, I have sort of like a selfish question, just like about sort of my own. It doesn't seem like it's necessarily lined up here, but like, um, I feel free to just pass on it, but. I'm wondering if like if any of your research has to do with like um like the visual visual cultural aspects of money and like you know the fact that like uh and this maybe makes sense but you know the fact that the queen is still on like canadian coins or whatever or in the mm -hmm. u.s we have fucking whoever mm -hmm. um is this something that you ever sort of confront or think through you know only a little bit i'm, I'm afraid you know i'm 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 here at the new center. I know as artist. I'm like a very non-visual person, so it's not my it's not my forte. Um, as far as like, you know, I mean, uh, one, I mean, as far as like the king being on the coins, there is that is kind of interesting. Um, so if we, so part of my work is about um, uh, Mediterranean antiquity, uh, ancient Greece, and and stuff like this, and. Uh, one interesting feature of Greek monetary history is that they didn't put um, the king on the coin. Um, it was kind of uh, uh, irreligious to do so. It's only with Alex uh, Philip, uh, Alexander's father, Philip and Alexander, um, who end up kind of conquering all of Greece, um, are the first Greek rulers to kind of put their image on the coin. And this is kind of considered to be a, a, a usurpation of kind of the... You know, it's it's kind of irreligious because t before that you would only have like pictures of animals and gods and stuff on on the coinage, and I, the, I think kind of what's the the point here is that there is a need to maintain an ideological narrative according to which money is not you know the king is not messing with the money. I mean, it's not the you know the money is not um, being given its value by the fiat of the king. It kind of really has value. It's it's God. That that supports the value of the money and the value of debt, rather than the king. And this this is really um, a central part of the struggle over money is is whether it's underwritten by by the king or or by God. Um, as far as like, but mostly like there have been the images of kings on on money in northern Europe for thousands of years, and I don't know. I don't have anything particularly profound to say um, about that. I'm afraid. Uh, uh, Sorry, I think somebody else was gonna, Nikki, were you gonna ask a question? Um, yeah, hey, I had a, more of an observation that I wondered if you could speak more on about um, assessments and austerity politics. 
um, I observed recently how a state had over assessed property values. And so the taxes paid were way higher than the values of the properties and there was a lot of foreclosures. And so when the people are asking for liability from the state, they're putting it on to basically the public services, mm -hmm. which is strange. It refers, it kind of reminds me of what you were saying earlier about how um, basically the state is like, yeah, we, we can pay for this, but not that. And how does, yeah, I, it kind of bewilders me how that how those decisions get made. Where, where was this happening that the overassessment was? Um, in Detroit. Okay. Oh, okay. Because the, because the values of everything collapsed and they're still trying to. Yeah, but even more recently, the assessments are still all over the place. So people are, like the middle class has been able to stay, but we've, we've had mass foreclosure problems uh -huh. Uh -huh. and the aclu aclu won a case about the over assessed like they were constitutionally um over taxed properties but it's this the state is like evading all responsibility hmm. interesting yeah so i mean um it's interesting because you know, sort of, the, it's an unusual problem. I think, uh, in historically, I mean, normally the problem is that things are underassessed. That actually, the the, the state kind of has a a problem with raising the assessments to like meet market values. So, um, um, essentially, because the typically, I mean, the state's ability, as I kind of talked about a little bit in my introductory spiel. I mean, the state's ability to raise revenue tends to be pegged to nominal values um, because it's very difficult for the state to revise because, because nobody wants to give the state the ability to revise how much money you, you owe to the state. So, so values tend to be sticky. You know? so, so a lot of the assessments um, in England uh, were set in, in the late 11th century. There's something called the Doomsday Book, um, which essentially... Uh, William the Conqueror went around and assessed the value of everything, and it was and it was called the Doomsday Book um, precisely because there was this feeling that it was impossible to get a reassessment, you know, um, before before Doomsday. Once it was written in the book, kind of, kind of, kind of, there it was. Um, it's interesting. I mean, uh, as over assessment. I mean the, I mean the, the the problem there is that you you know you're not going to be able to get anybody to to buy the houses. I mean they're they're trying to give away the houses in Detroit. At least they were last time I was looking at, at property in in Detroit. And and the problem is because you're you're sticking yourself with the tax bill. I mean that's the real the real cost of the of the land. So but but you had another question, another part of the question, which is so how does this relate to to choosing to spend one one thing or another? Uh, I, my question was about liability. Like if that money is demanded back. Who pays it? If that money is demanded back, who pays it? Which which money? The money that's being paid in the assessment? The money that, yeah, the money that was overpaid. Uh-huh. Well, it would have to come out of the coffers of the city. I mean, the, so, I mean, what's, what's it? So the, the cities, um, we no longer live in a world in which cities issue municipal coinages. So, so the, the city of Detroit is totally constrained by the dollar monetary system. Um, so the, the state has to, I mean, if the state is going to make refunds for overtaxing property in the past, I guess is the idea that's making reparations for overtaxing. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, it is constrained to, to cut other stuff out of its budget in order to do that because the city of Detroit doesn't have the ability to issue its own money. Um, not really, not inherently, there's no metaphysical reason. Um, I'm not sure exactly about what the legal considerations might be. Like if Detroit started trying to issue its own money in order to tax and spend in its own domestic economy, I don't know if that would be constitutional. I think it might be. Um, so, but I mean, but I mean the, the answer here is, I mean, I mean, I mean, yes, I mean, they, there is a trade-off in, you know, that, that, the, that the, the city of Detroit is constrained because it is not, uh, it is not a monetary sovereign. It doesn't issue, it doesn't denominate its own money. I mean, it has to meet bills in money that it has no power over. Um, so, 
at least like MMT doesn't give you any kind of direct uh, like like way out of this this dilemma that's being presented of like if we if we're gonna pay back you know we have to accept I mean to say that you know the city of Detroit might make a bid for monetary independence <laughs> um, and start minting its own money uh, you know but then the, you know then the question is you know just what you know what prevents the city from from doing that if it wanted to and it's kind of the same thing as we were talking about you know hypothetically Iraq earlier I mean it's just a question of um, you know, are there, does it have to meet, does it have to get dollars or not? I mean, the only reason that you ever need to get dollars is if somebody demands to be paid in dollars and if they have the power to demand to be paid in dollars. Uh, and that's ultimately yeah, a, a political, a strategic question. So I don't know if that was a terribly satisfying answer to your, to your question. Um, uh, I'll think about it maybe a little bit more. Um, uh, let's see. Here's a question from the comments. Um, wasn't the digital dollar dropped from the recent stimulus bill, but a digital euro remains on the table? How does state crypto disintermediate the function of private banks? Um, I, I don't. I don't know about the the digital euro question. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but the, but I can answer the second part. How does state crypto disintermediate the function of private banks? The the banking system that we have now. Is a, is a legacy of history. Um, it is not a system that is has to be like it is um, for any kind of technical reason. Um, it's just that, you know, when the banking system was designed, communications took place over <laughs> roads, you know, <laughs> ponies and things like this. Um, and ultimately banking is kind of a question of information. I mean, I mean banks, banks can create money out of information and the question is just how the information flows. And in that environment, you, you kind of need these central banks in the big port cities, you know, so you need New York as being a, a financial center. Um, and, um, you know, but now if we have, if, you know, if we have, and, and crypto, I think is kind of is a little bit a distraction. I mean, it, a, the crypto is just a ledger. I mean, that's all it does is just, it's just a ledger that, you know, you don't rely on trust of anybody in order to, um, but it's not really so hard to, to, to trust some institution. I mean, you don't even really need cryptocurrency to do it, but it's just the, it's just the fact that now there's no, there's no like geographical reason that, that there's no, there's no information processing or geographical constraint reason that we have to have this kind of hierarchy of banking systems um, because everybody can just, just get an account of the central bank if, if, if we decided that that's what that that's what we should do and what that would do is it would mean that you, there would no longer be this hierarchy of banks where you have a deposit at a regional bank and the regional bank has its deposits at the New York bank and the New York bank has its account at the Fed and all of that stuff so you would you would just cut out this entire hierarchy of middlemen um, who are all making money from from enabling that to happen and and I think it's partly for this reason is why, um, you know, like, so systems like the IRS, the IRS has a deliberately archaic um, processing system. So it's why we have this problem now. They want to give everybody a check. It's not nearly enough, but they're saying, you know, it might take four months for everybody to get their check. It's because they run the IRS on this 1960s mainframe. I mean, and in a way, I mean, it's, it is deliberately archaic technology in order to prevent precisely this, to, to prevent the idea that we could just all, you know, bank with the public. Um, so, so I mean, I mean, how do, so the question, I mean, how does crypto disintermediate the function of private banks? They're just no longer technically necessary in, in, in a way that they kind of were in, in the 19th century. Um, but, you know, I mean, but this is, uh, doing that would be very, very threatening to to, to a set of, of people who, who have a lot of institutional leverage, who have a lot of historically accumulated power, and they're able to, so far, to, to prevent us from doing that. Um, I mean, you know, the, the question would be, you know, so for example, like, uh, you know, so, so Doug Henwood, for example, has, you may be familiar with some of his writings. He's on this kind of anti-MMT crusade, um, you know, talking about how you know, we, he, he kind of has this Thomas Munn position that I talked about in my in my opening remarks. Um, and recently, you know, prompted by by uh, Corona, 
he was saying, you know, what we need to do is nationalize the banks. And it, it just in my head, I'm just wondering, I mean, what is the difference between nationalizing the banks and printing money out of nothing? I mean, that's what banks do is, is create money out of nothing by, by leveraging their, their assets. And, and, and so what's interesting is that there's a, this really intense ideological need to believe that banks can create money and this is like ontologically, metaphysically legitimate. And if the state creates money, then it's, it, you know, we'll have hyperinflation and it's an ontological scandal. There's this division being, that's been created um, that there's not really, but there's not really a great reason to believe that this, that this would be, this would be the case. And, and um, it's, it's, it's been created through this process of class struggle. That's sort of my, um, my, my thesis. So the, the, these articles, somebody has linked these articles in the chat, so you can check them out if you want to see what I'm talking about. Um, okay. Well, and I, I have another sort of aesthetic question. Yeah. And let me know if you, you, you want to stop, stop answering questions because I've asked a lot, but I'm wondering um, also about like, um, uh, like the relation of like land ownership um, cause I know there've been some discussions in, in the UK about how like slowly corporations have actually just been like buying huge swaths of rural land. Um, and, and I'm personally interested like in, in terms of like art practice and stuff like, you know, relationships with land and, and sort of aesthetics about like, you know, uh, whatever, like nature or something, but I'm wondering in terms of like, um, particularly when like we start talking about like, you know, like banking with the public and then like, I know there are discourses of like, um, uh, not just green economies, I can't remember what the, what the term is, but like environmental economics, where like uh, money is sort of in the subset of ecology or, or it's like within ecology. Um, uh, but I'm wondering also like, like we're talking about like roads and, and how that like impacts, that's like a geological or a geographical um, uh, precursor or something to our modern banking systems or whatever. But I'm, I'm wondering like if there's like, um, maybe this is just a yes or no question, but like there's, there's like a large component of actually like thinking about land and like um, deeds to land and like the ownership of land, maybe even mm -hmm. on these like ontological registers. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, uh, this is, I mean, this, so I mean, this kind of goes back to the question about assessments that, that we had earlier. Um, you know, I mean, what is the relationship between the, the monetary system and the, I don't know, the, maybe the land base, the real resource base um, that it supposedly refers to? Um, it's kind of a, it's a general question. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe one thing I would say is that, so I mean, part of the issue that the English state had in this crisis that I'm kind of suggesting leads to the development of the, of the modern monetary system is that it didn't have a lot of ability to tax land, in, in fact. Um, so the, the English state, the crown was kind of, it, it had like customs revenues, um, it had uh, various sorts of things like this, but it wasn't really able to just directly tax land um, and, and to directly tax like income and, and property real productive assets directly. Um, the English crown had to go to parliament to ask for, uh, for money and, and parliament kind of had to vote um, each time um, that it wanted to award the crown uh, what are called the tenths and fifteenths, which is um, this, this kind of like taxation. So there was no direct um, taxation of, of land. And this is sort of one of the major political conflicts, right? So, so the, the, the conflict in, that happens in Richard II um, is that uh, Richard II tries to seize the inheritance of Bolingbroke. So uh, Boling, Henry Bolingbroke, who is the cousin of Richard II, is the heir of the Lancastrian inheritance, which is the largest accumulation of land in England, um, larger than, than Richard's own land. And he tries to kind of exile Henry on kind of some trumped up grounds and, and seize his land. And this is eventually what um, causes the 
the the rebellion, right? So um, so Bolingbroke returns to England, gathers a bunch of support um, from other lords, and they overthrow uh, Henry. I mean, sorry, Richard II, um, because there was, it was seen as being totally illegitimate um, for the king to kind of directly and arbitrarily tax land, um, and we we get this eventually in. In, in, in only in the modern system. And so it's, it's part of this transformation that I'm talking about where the state begins to pay the liquidity premium. Um, it's only when that happens. It's, all, it's kind of only when the state begins to supply money as a free good to the public that it kind of gains the legitimacy to tax land and income and real productive assets directly and universally. And, and this is sort of a trade-off that, that happens because it's, it's sort of worth it to, to parliament, to the public, to allow the development of like modern universal taxation um, as a trade-off for being allowed to be supplied with money by the sovereign um, as, a, as a free good. Um, another, that's one maybe aspect of the relation between land and money. Another aspect is the creation of liquid um, real estate markets, so um, which can be used as collateral. So um, in fact, um, prior to the Reformation, prior to Henry VIII's disillusion of the monasteries, um, most land kind of wasn't able to be sold. Like <laughs> um, you didn't actually, even if you owned the land, you didn't really have the right to sell it, to alienate it, um, either because the land is owned by the church and the church never sells anything, um, or because the land is owned by aristocratic families and it is, it's called entailed. So if the land is entailed, um, you lack the ability to sell it. And if you can't sell your land, then you can't borrow against it. That's, that's the problem. So in, in, in order to mortgage my land, in order to, um, to, to raise money against its future revenues, I have to be able to, in principle at least, alienate it, to sell it. Um, and this wasn't true. So um, it's an important part of the transformations of the 16th century um, that you get the development, you get the dissolution of monasteries um, all across Europe and um, kind of casting this land onto the land market where it can be used as collateral in order to really to create private money, right? So when banks create private money, they do so by collateralizing assets, by 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 borrowing, by using them as as you know the what the, the what's really anchoring all of this credit that they're generating. And so, an important part of the expansion of the money supply in the 16th century is related to the to the creation of of, of markets in, in land, right? And and but this is you know this is this is what Richard is doing, but, um, kind of before this becomes available to uh, as a general strategy for the economy is that he's he's mortgaging. Um, his his crown lands in order to use them as as collateral. Um, so so land is a very important collateralized asset, but also um, chattel slaves. So we're here talking about a world that is very much wrapped up in the Atlantic slave trade, um, and people um, enslaved people are another kind of uh, important form of liquid asset that is um, part of what enables the expansion of the of the credit system. So so you know so not only do we have the state creating money, and this is another important thing to kind of realize about money um, is that, you know, some money is created by the state, but a lot of money is created by private banks um, that, that uh, create money by loaning it into existence. Um, in order for this to be possible, they have to have assets that they can collateralize. And so the demand for the production of collateralizable assets is um, a kind of independent economic imperative, right? So we normally think about economic imperatives as being about, you know, producing goods that can be consumed and, and producing value and all of this kind of stuff. Um, but there's another important aspect of, of economic processes, which involve the demand for collateralizable assets. We need to produce assets that can be, collateral, can, can be collateralized um, because they're kind of valuable in, in themselves. Um, and so that's, that's a very important part of the um, sort of the development of like modern land markets. And it's, and it's only, you know, and that's what happened in, in Detroit, right? So, I mean, so if we think about, I mean, what is it that led to the situation in Detroit where you have a collapse of the market value of assets below their assessed tax value? Well, it's because all of this land was being used as collateral by 
banks who package it into mortgage-backed securities, um, essentially because they want these mortgage-backed securities to be treated as money. Um, so I don't know how much of the details people in the of this the people in the class know. Um, so so the, so kind of what happened in two thousand eight is that um, you get so so the idea is that um, that real estate market all around the country are supposed to be uncorrelated, right? So that means that, you know, if, if the market is bad in Detroit, uh, does, that doesn't necessarily imply that the market is bad in California. They're uncorrelated with, with each other. Um, and so what people were doing in the run up to 2008 was, um, you know, originating a bunch of mortgages uh, that may or may not be able to ever be paid off they package these mortgages all together, slice them up. Um, and the idea is that you can create out of these if you slice them up and then you tranche them. So tranching means that I take an asset and I divide it into senior and junior tranches. And the senior tranche gets paid first before the junior tranche. So if, so if, if the asset collapses and you have the junior tranche, you're out of luck. That's a risk asset. Um, but I can take the other half of it, the senior tranche, and that's a safe asset. So what happens is that all of these mortgage-backed securities are being generated um, by, by lending money to, to, to people um, who didn't really have much of a chance to pay them back. They're being cut up into these mortgage-backed securities. And then out of that, a senior tranche is being cut out. And the Moody's, the rating agency, comes and says, that's a AAA asset. That's safe. We've proven with our models um, that because the real estate market is uncorrelated, uh, that's safe. That's a AAA asset. And what that means is that that asset is money, right? So it is equivalent to money. It is just as good as money. A bank is allowed to put that senior tranche MBS security on their books and say, this is collateral. This is safe. It's just as good as owning a, a U.S. Treasury bond. And Moody's, Standard & Poor's, they say, yeah, that's true. We certify that. So what they're doing is taking land and turning it into money through the financial system. And it's the collapse of that, of that money creating engine that, um, that, that, that dro dro drove the value of all this, all of this land down and, and blew a hole in the, in, the, in the fiscal position of cities like Detroit. Um, so it's, so, I mean, it's, it's, you're only able to get violent swings in the in the land market like that because of the way that the the real estate market is is integrated into the monetary system and, and people are using it in order to, to really to create money i mean quite literally yeah hey, um i have a question about um to dovetail off of what you're saying i have a question about land banking mm -hmm. um because um it's from the situation that you're describing, when that that collateral gets collected, it goes to the U.S. Treasury. And um, what happened in Detroit in 2008 is we created a land bank, so that mm -hmm. property goes from the Treasury right to the land bank to be auctioned off. And often, like these homes are still occupied, so they're being auctioned off to whoever on some online market. Um, they do include all the back taxes, so whether the home is foreclosed on because of mortgage is not being paid or from property taxes aren't being paid, like the next owner inherits those taxes. But we have, I know not all cities in the U.S. have land banking, so I think that the way that we do it is really different. But we have two rounds of the auction where like the first round, it includes all the back taxes on it. But if it doesn't make it through the first round, it like those taxes get cleared. And so there's like a base fee that the auction starts off. It's like $1,000 a home. But I don't know if you could talk about land banking at all. Land banking. I mean, so, so I'm not really, I'm not sure I'm familiar with the term. Um, so, so, I mean, the, the, these are, these are, once the, the properties go into foreclosure, they're seized by the city. That's, is that right? And then they go to the land bank? Um, they go to the U.S. Treasury, and then they go to the land bank. And not all cities have land banks. We have two land banks, one for the city and one for the county. Uh -huh. um, 
I'm confused by this because I'm, I'm not. I'm, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say the job of the job of the land bank is to make that asset usable as soon as possible. Uh -huh. So it's it's just mm -hmm. its job is to flip to flip the property as yes, fast as possible. Yes. Right. Right. So I'm to I'm make not it entirely taxable again, or to make pay off the taxes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I, I can, I, I'm not entirely sure how that ends up in the treasury. I'm a little confused about that. So I'd have to, I have to look at that. But I can, I can, I think offer something to say about this question of like making it usable again as, as soon as, as soon as possible. Um, so in order for assets to be money, there has to be a, a dealer market in that asset. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the dealer market and what the dealer market is. And I think that might help uh, get some insight into this. So like, um, you know, so, okay. So, so money, we can trade for things, uh, but only if a market exists. So the, in most traditional theories of money, which come from Aristotle, the existence of the market is not called into question. We kind of just assume as given that there is a market that I can go to and spend my money. Um, Marx also makes this assumption in, in capital. Um, but as we've kind of, some of us may have experienced recently, I mean, money doesn't do any good if the market closes down. For example, if there's a pandemic and everybody leaves the market and now there is no market, um, your money is no good. So the money has to, I mean, the market has to be in existence in order for, for money or any other asset to be money. And so, um, so here we have a situation in which um, through the production of mortgage-backed securities and all this other kind of stuff, um, we've turned all this land into money and but the problem is all of a sudden there's a run on the money. Everybody says, yesterday I thought that this land was money um, and I've been treating it like money. Um, and today I realized that this land is not money. And all of a sudden I want to swap this land for other, for something, some other kind of asset that really is money. Um, that there's, a, there's a run on the bank. It's really, it's a run on the bank. And, 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 and what has to be done in order to stop this is that some entity has to act as a, a dealer of last resort. Um, so in order to understand that, we need to kind of think about what a dealer is. So um, if I go to the market and I want to sell something, you know, the, I mean, the, the market is a physical place, whether it's, whether it's a physical place in um, electronically, I mean, it, it is still a physical place electronically, you know, people pay, um, millions and millions of dollars to rent office space directly across the street from the from the from the uh, stock exchange, so that they can get a few more milliseconds of latency trading on the market. Right. So even in a, a electronic world, the market is a physical place that you have to go to in order to trade. Um, and I might go to the market and find somebody else already there who wants to take the opposite trade from me. Um, but that's not normally what happens. Normally, if I go to the market, I need to transact with a dealer. And the, the dealer differs from what we can call a time investor. So if, if I am a time investor, what that means is that I want to transact now. I'm not waiting around. I mean, I need to spend my money on something or I need to sell the thing that I have. I'm time motivated. And, and I only want to be a buyer or a seller. I'm, I'm a buyer and I want to buy now or I'm a seller and I want to sell now. Um, traditional theories of the market we find from Aristotle works only include time invest, time, time traders. Um, but most likely the other party on the side of my transaction when I go to the market is what's called a dealer. And the dealer is somebody who is willing to be either a buyer or a seller depending on the price, okay? So the dealer doesn't care whether they're buying or selling they only care about what the price is. If the price is low enough, I'm a, I'm a buyer. If the price is high enough, I'm a seller. And so what the dealer does is they sit there in the market and they quote a spread. So I said at the very beginning of my remarks, I was going to try to show you over the course of the seminar that money is a system of differences. Um, this is where the difference comes in, right? So the dealer 
quotes two prices at once. The dealer says the price is this, and the price if you're buying is this other price, which is going to be a little bit higher. They, they quote a spread. And the dealer's job is to match demand for buying and selling by holding assets on their book for a very short amount of time, right? So I walk into the market and sell an asset. Now the dealer has this asset and they're hoping that somebody else 10 minutes later was going to come into the market and, and buy the asset. But, but I was motivated by time. I had, I had to leave, right? So, so normally in the, in the normal state of functioning of the market, um, there are all these dealers in the market who are willing to wait um, to, to, uh, to, to, to wait to buy or sell depending on what the price is. And what happens in an event like 2008 is that the dealer market vanishes, okay? And the reason that the dealer market vanishes is because the spread gets too big. Um, essentially because everybody wants to sell, right? So everybody is trying to sell all at once which means that now the dealers are buying these assets until they can't, they don't have enough money to be able to buy them all up anymore, to be able to afford them, right? So, um, and so in order to make it worthwhile for them to continue buying the assets, they have to um, increase the spread that they're, that they're quoting. And once the spread gets big enough, the market simply ceases to exist. There is no market because there are no dealers. All there is, is a bunch of people who want to sell this stuff that yesterday was money and today is no longer money. And so what happens in a situation like 2008 is that it's not just that the prices are crashing, but that in fact, prices cease to exist. There are no prices anymore because there is no market in which things are being bought and sold. And so it seems to me that like kind of what you're describing is an attempt to use this land bank um, kind of as a, as, a, as a dealer that is going to be a dealer when nobody else wants to be. So this is a dealer that is kind of backstopped by the public in, in some way, or it has a kind of public mandate in order to perform the function of dealer in order to try to recreate a market in which prices can exist at all. Um, and this is what the Fed does in the in the in the at the top of the monetary system, but I think kind of what what you're showing that this function can also exist more more locally. That that there might be you know the 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 big problem is you know, we need to make these markets liquid, like not only so that we can raise the price of the assets, but like just so that they can be priced at all. Because the problem is that they have they have no no, no price. There's all of these, um, you know, I mean there's there's all of these assets and nobody wants to buy them. Maybe, maybe partly because of the, of the, of the assessments. I mean, it's not, it's, it's just a liability. I mean, um, you own this land and it isn't worth anything and you can't do anything with it and you just have to pay taxes on it. So it's not. And so, and so really, I mean, you're seeing like this, this urge. I mean, we need to like recreate a market. We need to make it so that there are transactions happening. Um, which is, which is not normally like what we think about when we think about financial crisis. Like we're normally used to thinking about financial crisis as just being a collapse of assets. You know, the price goes down, but there still is a price because we're used to assuming that, that the market just exists and just prices things. Um, but, but, but here, here, I think, I think, you know, what, what, what we're looking at here is market making activity um, that is being taken over by the state uh, when the private sector basically decides it's not worth it anymore. And they all, they all get out. And this is what happened kind of recently, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, when there was this big federal um, Fed Reserve um, intervention into repo markets, um, the same thing was happening, right? All of the dealers in the private sector were saying, I don't want to be a dealer anymore. I mean, there's no, and then the market just ceases to exist. And, and the Fed has to come in and say, I'm going to be the dealer. I'm going to do these transactions so that people who want to sell can sell and people who want to buy can buy. Um, and so... You know, and so and so it is the state assuming that function, right? I mean, the, the fact that the state assumes that function of being the dealer of last resort, of being the one who bottom lines the demand for the market to exist, that is a historically constituted thing. It's not natural. It's like not given. Um, and it is very much about the stuff that I'm trying to say about how the, the state takes on the role 
of paying the liquidity premium of, of assuming the, the job of paying the price to, to ensure that that markets exist at all. And previously this just wasn't, this wasn't, wasn't the case. Um, this was all done in the private sector um, in, you know, in medieval, in medieval period. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So we've got about half an hour left. Um, maybe I want to, I want to kind of take a look at a little bit of um, just Richard the second to kind of give you just a little taste. Um, so, uh, so I'll make sure, so I'm going to cut some of the readings, I think, because you won't have time to, to read them all. So, um, so what I'd really like to do is, is over the next three sessions that we have, I'd like to talk a little bit more about Richard the second um, next time. Um, and possibly in possibly Henry the fourth part one, if, if we can, um, that I have a bunch of background reading to give you about kind of early modern monetary history, uh, James and his deficit spending and all of that. Um, it's not going to break my heart if you can't get through all of it for for every every session. Um, there's a lot there. Unfortunately, there's no brief introduction to any of these any of these topics. I'm, I'm going to try to give you orally. Um, kind of the stuff that matters. Um, but what I would like to do is to kind of dig into Shakespeare next time, since we didn't get much of a chance to do it. Um, and I will, I'm, I deeply apologize that we had a, this technical mix up for this time. Um, but what I want to look at um, is a scene. Um, so if you, if you pull up um, on your, if you Google Richard the second, Richard to MIT, it will take you to the full text of the, of the play. They're all available online. Um, and what I would like to look at is um, it's it's a scene that is uh, Act Two, Scene One, Line Ninety Three, um, which if you will search in that MIT document um, for the phrase "I am in health," uh, it'll take you there. So King Richard says, "I am in health. I breathe and see the ill." Um, so what I want to to look at is that so what's happening in this scene is that uh, so in, in act one, there has been a, uh, a kind of duel between uh, two characters, Thomas Mowbray, Henry Bolingbroke, um, as, a, as a result of this uh, challenge. So basically they have both come to Richard and accused one another of treason. Uh, there's a very complicated backstory behind this that we don't necessarily need to get into. As a, as a result of this, he has banished both of them. So he has, he basically has, he, Richard has refused to let Mowbray and Bolingbroke um, fight to the death in this duel as they're supposed to. Um, the reason for this is that he's worried about incriminating himself. So in fact, um, Richard is responsible for the murder of this guy, uh, the Duke of Gloucester. And uh, he's worried that if he lets them fight it out, then uh, his complicity in this murder will, will come to light. And so he's banished both of them. And uh, meanwhile, um, John of Gaunt, who is uh, Henry's, uh, sorry, Richard's uncle and the father of Henry Bolingbroke is dying. Okay, so Henry Bolingbroke is in exile for uh, 10 years and his father is dying and Richard is going to seize uh, the the lands that that Henry is owed while he's while he's away after his after his father John of Gaunt dies and this the scene that I want to look at just briefly is um, a scene in which John of Gaunt is reproaching Richard uh, on his deathbed so John of Gaunt is dying and so he finally gets to tell Richard what he really thinks about him um, and so uh, um, so, so, so Richard comes to, to Gaunt on his deathbed and, and Gaunt says, um, uh, now he that made me knows I see thee ill, ill in myself to see and in thee seeing ill. Thy deathbed is no lesser than thy land wherein thou liest in reputation sick. And thou, too careless patient as thou art, committest thou anointest, anointed body to the cure of those physicians that first wounded thee. A thousand flatterers sit within thy crown, whose compass is no bigger than thy head, and yet, encaged in so small a verge, the waste is no whit lesser than thy land. Oh, had thy grandsire with a prophet's eye seen how his son's son should destroy his sons, from forth thy reach he would have laid thy shame, deposing thee before thou wert possessed. 
which art possessed now to depose thyself. Why, cousin, weren't thou regent of the world, it were a shame to let this land by lease. For but for thy world enjoying but this land, is it not more than shame to shame it so? Landlord of England art thou now, not king. Thy state of law is bond slave to the law. And thou, and then, and then he, Richard cuts him off. And so I just want to, I want to, I want to reflect a little bit about this passage. And I want to, to think about what it is exactly that, that Gaunt is saying. Um, so first of all, that, that Richard has um, commit, committed his body to the cure of the physicians that wounded him. Um, so does anybody, anybody have any guess? What, what is he talking about here? If he, if he says that you've, you've, you've committed your cure to the, to the physicians that wounded you, who is he talking about? I guess. We can, uh, there's, there's, there's modern precedence for this. So essentially what, what Gaunt is, is complaining about is that Richard is borrowing more money in order to pay the interest on the debt that he has already borrowed, okay? So the problem is that, um, so, 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 so Richard has come to Gaunt and, and said, you know, oh, you're, you're dying. And Rich, Gaunt is saying to Richard, I'm not dying, you are dying, right? You're the one who's really dying here. And the reason that he's saying this is because Richard is, you know, doing the same stuff that got him into debt in order to try to deal with the fact that he's in debt, right? So Richard has to borrow more money in order to pay the interest on his debt. He's selling off his land. Um, well, what's the consequence of that? Well, if he sells off his land, then he has less revenue. And so he has to borrow more and that's gonna lead him to selling off his, his land, right? So Gaunt is describing Richard as being caught in this kind of fiscal death spiral in which he's becoming uh, more and more indebted. Um, so think, for example, um, about um, if you followed kind of the, the Greek debt crisis, um, you know, a, a, about a decade ago, I mean, what was happening in that crisis? Well, the whole thing was about, you know, the only, po the only political question was whether the IMF was going to loan Greece the money to pay the interest on the money that the IMF had just loaned Greece, right? I mean, so um, with, with kind of the ultimate end game that the goal was to seize Greek assets, right? The goal was to induce the Greek state to sell off its sovereign assets like ports and, and highways and infrastructure and stuff like this, right? And, and so Gaunt, Gaunt is complaining that, that Richard has pursued this path of, of spiraling and indebtedness. And, um, and the result of this is that he has become no longer a king, but landlord of England, right? You're just a landlord, you're, you're not the king because really all of the revenue from your, from your lands is just going to your creditors. Um, and he says, thy state of law is bond slave to the law. Okay. And I wanna think about this, this word bond slave. Okay, so bond is another word that is going to come up a lot in this play, right? So base, bond, these are all words, right? So we use this word bond in order to describe the debt of states, right? That's what you trade, you trade US treasury bonds. I mean, um, and I don't think it's normally uh, recognized that the word bond literally comes from the word bondage. I and mean, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a state of, of unfreedom. You are, you, are, you are bonded to pay this, this thing. Um, and the complaint is that Richard, by kind of going down the path towards this modern fiscal state in which the, the modern deficit state, right? The state which is always spending money it doesn't have, which is always borrowing in order to pay my money that it borrowed so that it can borrow more. I mean, this is the way that our, our state works. Um, but here, Gaunt is presenting this as being kind of this corruption of sovereignty, right? Richard has um, become no longer no longer a king. Instead, this servile um, a bond slave to the law, right? There is a law which binds Richard, and this is a a kind of a scandal. Um, the idea that 
the king himself might be subject to the law um, and that, that he's not able, able to alter uh, because you know, an alternative conception is that all law proceeds from the king and that the king is not, not bound by, by any law. So, um, so, it, so, so kind of re to return to MMT just a little bit, right? So I don't think that the MMT theorists really appreciate or understand um, the fact that what they are is really uh, neo-absolutists. So um, uh, you may be familiar with, there's a, a political 16th century political philosopher named uh, Jean Baudin, who's a, a French writer and who is kind of underst understood to be the, uh, the, one of these important theorists of, of the absolutist state. And one of Jean Baudin's fundamental propositions is that the king cannot bind himself by his own promises. Okay. The king, according to the absolutist conception of Jean Baudin, is not able to promise something that will commit himself in the future. The king is always able to break the promises that he's made in the past. There is no power that can possibly bind the king to obey his own promises. Um, and this is essentially what MMT argues. MMT essentially argues that there is no power over and above sovereignty that can compel it to, to, to can enable it to bind itself to, um, to not printing more money in order to maintain the value of assets, right? So, so MMT theorists are really presenting a neo-absolutist uh, theory of the state, um, a la Jean Baudin. And kind of what I, what I want us to, to, be, to think about is the way that kind of over the course of this, of this English political history, we do get the idea that it is, it is uh, good and the way the world can and should work for there to be a law that is over uh, and above the king that binds the king and that the king is um, unable to intervene into. And uh, not only do we get the idea that this is a law, we also get in much of our mainstream discourse, the idea that this is an ontological principle, right? That, that in fact, the sovereign lacks the power to break its own promises by repudiating its debt, by debasing the money or anything like this. And that it's not only a kind of a scandal, but that it is an ontological principle, that the laws of economics are such that anything the king tries to do in order to intervene um, into the monetary system by abolishing debt, by changing the value of the money is ultimately going to be neutral in, in the long run. And you know, uh, what I think is important about Shakespeare in which we will um, see as we get towards the end of the second tetralogy and we examine um, the figure of, of Henry V who is kind of uh, Shakespeare's idea of an, of an ideal ruler. Um, we're, we're, we're going to get the idea that maybe, you know, that uh, there is something wrong that we've lost something in embracing this idea of sovereignty of, of, of as being, you know, a servant of the law and, and nothing else. Um, and that, you know, so, so Shakespeare kind of has a nostalgia for this, um, for this, for this, you know, so Shakespeare feels that something has been, you know, there's something about the majesty and the grandeur of sovereignty and kingship that has been lost in the development of this, um, this, this liberal constitution, according to which, you know, the, there we have this floating public debt and the king is pledged to defend it, even if it means uh, destroying himself, allowing his head to be cut off. Um, you know, in our current, in, the, in America, we ritually execute the king every four years in, in a certain kind of way, right? We have this system according to which we present, we prevent the king from ever acquiring enough power to intervene in, into the debt system. And we normally think this is a good thing. Our, our kind of, our biases um, are, is to be that kings are bad, you know, and it was a good idea to cut the head off the king. And this is kind of the one thing that everybody can agree about, whether you're on the right or the left or whatever. And kind of, you know, what I want us to kind of try to entertain is, I mean, what if there's something that we really need about this older mode of sovereignty um, in which the king does have the power to be above the law and to intervene into the, into the debt, precisely because the, 
kind of only alternative is to lose all our power um, to creditors and oligarchs as, as we see in, in situations like, like in that of Greece, right? And so, I mean, the question would be, I mean, is there any hope? Is there any possibility for reasserting a kind of sovereignty against the credit system in the present moment? Um, and what would be kind of the political implications of, of that? I mean, that's kind of the question that I want to, that I, that I want to raise. And I, and I hope that, that Shakespeare might, might give us a little bit of, of insight into. So, um, so as, as I hope you'll see, um, so the, there's four plays in, in the Tetralogy um, after the fall of Richard II. So in Richard II, we get sort of the end of this mythical um, dynasty and everything is kind of about silver and gold and there's this idea of like pure value and what we're going to enter into when we begin reading Henry the fourth part one is a world of fake money um, of, of small change we're going to encounter the character of Falstaff who is always um, running up debts that he never intends to pay um, and, and all of this stuff and so um, and so and so really the question is um, it's a kind of challenge to what I could maybe call a kind of Kantian common sense, right? So if you've read Kant's second critique, um, critique of practical reason, um, does anybody know what is the first example of a moral um, quandary that Kant, that Kant uses in this, in the second critique? Like what's the, when he gives an example of what an ethical action is, like what's the very first thing that he talks about? Does anybody, anybody know? It's, uh, it's, it's paying your debts. Okay, so, so Kant's, the thing that he immediately applies the categorical imperative to is, is the idea of paying your debt, right? And the idea of Kant is, of course, that if, if, if I repudiate my debt, if I make a lying promise and I don't do what I promised that I was going to do, then I'm at risk of undermining the entire system of obligation that structures society, right? I mean, we're as soon as I repudiate a debt. We're on the slippery slope. Nobody can trust each other. Nobody can do, you know, it's just impossible, right? And this is an idea that is very compelling to us, right? That we have to pay our debts. Um, but what I'm trying to suggest to you is that if the debts always have to be paid, if there is no mechanism in the financial system for writing down debts, for repudiating promises, that's also impossible. Right? So this is the critique of Kant, that what Kant imagines as the consistency of a world in which everybody always pays their debts according to the categorical imperative, this world is just as impossible as the world in which nobody does what they say they're going to do, okay? And what I'm gonna to try to show you is that this is where sovereignty lives in between these two impossible worlds, right? Sovereignty lives in, in between the impossible world in which nobody pays their debts and the impossible world in which everybody pays their debts. And the problem is that in the modern world, we have taken sovereignty off the table. We have constructed in all kinds of ways, and partly we've been able to do this because modern financial technology allows us to roll over debts forever and ever, right? I never, you never have to default if I can just loan you more money in order to pay the debt that you owe me. And if we can engage in financial trickery of various kinds, we can maybe make this go on forever. But what we see in events like 2008 or in events like what's happening now is that it's not really true. Eventually this stuff all has to collapse. And this is where sovereignty emerges. There's the problem of somebody has to decide which promises are gonna be broken and which promises are gonna be fulfilled. And this is kind of like a necessary structural feature of the of, of the credit system. And, and this is a problem that I think that Shakespeare is very, very worried about in this set of plays. And he's trying to think through this, right? So the question is, you know, if, 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 if having an arbitrary king who can just do whatever he wants, that's a problem. But having a, a king who has no power to make arbitrary incisions in the, in the financial system is also going to lead us to collapse. Um, and then the problem becomes, I mean, how do we resuscitate an idea of, of sovereignty um, that, that might be able to get us out of this bind, right? And MMT begins to do that. This, this is the point, right? MMT begins to do that because it says, look, I'm gonna introduce this idea of monetary sovereignty. The debt that the state owes is just money. They're the same thing. There's no limit. We can just, we can just spend. 
But what MMT is lacking, and I think the uneasiness that a lot of people have with MMT um, when, when they approach it is, is this theory of class struggle. It's like, why would the sovereign behave as though it were impotent, even though it really has this power? And, and the answer is that it has to, you know, it wants to preserve the, the, the value of assets that are, that are owned by the wealthy. It wants to avoid debasing the money. Um, and it wants to use its sovereignty in order to, um, to, to appropriate from, from vulnerable people in order to preserve the value of the money, right? I mean, so what happened in 2008 was that sovereignty was faced with a choice. Sovereignty could either allow the money to stop being money or it could uh, kick people out of their homes. And what it chose was to kick people out of their homes into homelessness, death, all these kind of things, right? To, to commit extreme violence against its own citizens in order to prevent the money from, from being written down. And, and this is what entity lacks. They lack this theory of, 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 of why there might be you know, political struggles internal to the, to the political order that would, that would explain why sovereignty acts this way as something other than a question of, of false consciousness, right? So, so MMT makes, makes, a, makes a good um, beginning into, into reintroducing this kind of repressed idea of sovereignty um, into our monetary discourse. Um, but because MMT's notion of sovereignty is just tautological, it's, it's just a kind of, it's, you know, this thing is the same as this thing, we can interchange them. It, it lacks a kind of appreciation for these kind of political dy dynamics. And that's what we're gonna be trying to explore. Um, Okay, we just have a few more minutes. Anybody have any kind of closing questions or reflections or anything like that? Um, I hope this all made some kind of some kind of sense to you. Um, I just want to quickly maybe um, just comment on this because it just re reminded me of um, in the past. I, I used to teach math for finance uh, just by accident, and um, I was blown away back when I was looking of how bankers kind of prioritize um, responsibility. And I think this might be relating a bit to what you're saying, or at least it reminded me that it felt to me the way that they were talking about the portfolio arrangements or like what they need to take care of first is no matter what needs to, uh, stockhold, uh, stockholders need to be paid first, no matter what. And I kind of, I've never seen such a consistent kind of thesis throughout like you know, like portfolio arrangement and how things is very important. So back then it just, I was thinking about like, this doesn't feel the way that citizens are treated in terms of like when things are being owed to us. Uh, and that's something kind of reminds me what you said right now that the sovereignty is living between these two impossible worlds. It feels like on one side is this, no matter what and challenge kind of uh, debt or like you owe something to the stockholders uh, first, no matter what. That it's unthinkable to not pay back the the dividends, uh, you know, of your investors. Like yeah. that's what I got from that course, uh, that sessions that I was having with this banker. But then the tax, you'll do anything you can, anything possible you can, to you know, it's a burden, you know. And then okay, obviously that goes also to citizens, like what they're being owed. Uh, when they decide to, you know, participate in, in the, but yeah, I don't know if we can comment on this mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, like I said before, I mean, this is, that ideology is a product of the English financial revolution. It did not exist before, right? So when, when Philip II, the, the king of Spain in the 16th century is borrowing money, it is assumed that Philip II might decide not to pay you if various things happen, right? So th there are these things called the Asiento contracts, um, which are basically they're, they're the, the the gold comes in from from a New World into the port of Seville, and uh, and he sells it before it gets there, right? But there's all of these contingency clauses in there, which basically says, well, if there's a storm and the and the ship doesn't make it, then I'm not going to pay you, right? So there's all of these contingents. Um, uh, in the contracts, there's these, these contingency clauses that say, you know, you might not get paid. That is, there are no contingency clauses in a US treasury bond, right? I mean, you are gonna get paid, period, right? That's this idea of the, of the safe asset. And in order to make that possible, 
you have to have a very different conception of sovereignty because you do not have a conception of sovereignty according to which there is sovereign and there are subjects, right? That's how it works in Philip's Spain. Philip is the sovereign and the people that he's borrowing from are subjects. What you get in the aftermath of the English 17th century is an idea that there is an identity between the people who are loaning the money and the people who are borrowing the money, they are the same, right? So you get the idea that the public debt is a debt that we owe to ourselves, right? Question is, who is this we, who is the ourselves, right? When we talk about taxpayer money, we're also invoking this figure of the, the citizen who is, at, who is both at the same time, a creditor and a debtor of the state. And this is the, what under, underwrites the legitimacy of this entire political order is this idea that you know, the public debt is, is a debt that we owe to ourselves. Um, and I think the point is that obviously this obscures class conflict, right? I mean, because it's not the case that we owe the debt to ourselves. I don't, I don't own any treasury bonds. I mean, when the, when the, when the state guarantees the, the treasury bonds, it's not, it's not money that it owes to me. Is, is money that it owes to, you know, big institutional investors. I mean, if I had a retirement fund, I might own some of it and in, in through my pension fund or something like that. I don't, I don't have one of those. Um, but, but there is this, this idea of an identity, right, between the ruler and the rule, which is fundamental to this, to this liberal constitutional order that enables um, the public debt to serve as money. And, be, and, and, and the problem is that if we don't have that, if we don't have that idea that the public debt is paid no matter what um you know is the ultimate safe asset unless you have that theory of legitimacy it's impossible to have the modern monetary system you can't have it because you the um because the public debt is a risk asset as opposed to being a safe asset and if the public debt is a safe is a risk asset it can't be used for money the whole point of money is that money is the safest asset in, in, in the investing environment, right? Money is, is a safe asset. It has, and if it's safe, it has a very small spread, right? I don't pay a big liquidity premium to, 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 to charge and spend money, right? If I, if I want to buy, if I want to buy and sell risk assets, I have to, I have to pay the dealer market a big spread in order to, to get liquidity in this asset, but money, the liquidity of money is very cheap. And that's because it is a safe asset. And it is only possible for it to be a safe asset once we have deposed the king, right? This is the point. We have to depose the king. And not only do we depose the king, we ritually depose the king over and over and over and over again, right? We do it every four years just to show the king that he's not really the king. Um, and, and so, you know, so kind of my thesis is that, you know, the, the reason that we can't do MMT I mean, the, the reason that even though it's possible, even though the Federal Reserve can print money out of nothing to do whatever it wants, the reason that we cannot and do not and have not been printing money out of nothing to fight climate change is because what that would do is it would threaten to crown the king again. And that is what cannot happen if the liberal constitutional order is to continue. Yeah, that's that's the problem is that it threatens to recrown the king. And that's why we just we can't do that. And so and so that's why I'm saying to you, you know, what would be the stakes of us deciding that what we wanted to do was crown crown a king <laughs> again? I mean, it's, it's, it's a weird it's a weird position. I mean, we're not, you know, I mean, normally like people on the left or whatever don't go around being monarchists. Right? I mean, it's not a left leftist monarchism is not a uh, a common a common political view but i think this is this is kind of where mmt this is the, the problem that mmt leads to i mean what, what what would it mean for us to to crown a king again in order to say here is the king he has the power to decide what to do with the money he has the power to decide who gets paid and, and who doesn't pay, get paid i mean it's it's a it's a fundamental challenge to the constitutional order that, that we live in um, and so and so that's why you know so mmt people will say it's not political it's just technical. It's not political. It's just how the monetary system works. You know, we're just we're just friendly wonks explaining to you how how money really works. And I, I'm it's kind of the point of the seminar is to say no, 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 no. I mean, MMT is a fundamental challenge 
to this constitutional order that was that was really created by the by the by the English 17th century. Okay, well we're out of time um, for next time. For for next time, please, if you uh, read nothing else, read Richard II and as much of Henry the Fourth Part One as as you can, because I really want to talk about some Shakespeare uh, next time. And I will send all the rest of the readings to you, and you can read about the coins and stuff if you want. But there's a lot of detail, and it's not so important you get through them. But I'd really like to talk about Shakespeare next time. And uh, so I, I look forward to seeing all of you uh, next week. Cheers. Oh, and can I ask one question? Oh, did he leave? Yes, he, he already left. Okay. okay. A bit too late. Also, I, I just wanted to remind everyone that the next session is in two weeks uh, from today, not one week. Okay, great. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye.